Welcome to the Nick and Matt Show. Bringing the player interviews you want to hear and the hot topics you want to discuss. Streaming live on the Foundation Podcast YouTube channel, here's Nick and Matt. Welcome to episode 45. This is the Nick and Matt Show, and I am joined by, if you're watching live, not Nick, I'm joined by my older brother, Josh. Josh, how's it going, man? Oh, it's going awesome. I'm excited to be here. I'm not sure what kind of impression I'll give of uh, Nick Carl, but uh, yeah, excited <laughs> to be here. So Nick is in the chat holding it down. I hey, think he's, Nick. Woo. Yeah, I think he's on a train ride, which has got to be unique. I've never done that before. Um, so people are telling him safe travels, drive safely. And he's in here chatting it up. I think he's fine. All right. So Josh, let's tell people a little bit about who we are. I mean, I say we, because you're my older brother. You got me by four and a half years and I keep track, not five, <laughs> four and a half years. And, um, what's your earliest memory of playing Frisbee? Oh, wow. Earliest memory. Um, it gets, it gets fuzzy, but realistically it would be throwing frisbee like a catch disc probably honestly matt with our mother but then obviously it transitioned to you and i taking it pretty serious and when i say serious we're talking like kids having fun in the backyard but that's probably my earliest memory throwing back and forth playing catch trying every kind of throw we could uh those were good times <laughs> yeah uh you and i both remember specifically one throw it's so funny you threw it just it was like a fast back frisbee like picture sonic right oh okay we'll talk about that in a minute it, like and someone threw it really hard you did i think and i was running and the hill kind of descended and like i just remember reaching out and this was before ultimate was like a thing at least that i knew of right. ultimate but yeah. that's what we were doing and it just stands out amazing throwing and catching good times and i honestly do thank mom for introducing us to Frisbee. I really think that's where it came from. I loved seeing Oh, it. it definitely made it a more natural transition and in interest, Matt, for you and I when somebody mentioned this thing called disc golf, right? It wasn't a far, we didn't really know what it was, but it wasn't a far-fetched idea because we're like, yeah, discs, Frisbees, let's try it. <laughs> Here we are all these years later. It's true. I was like, yeah, I like Frisbees. And they're like, you do? And I'm like, yeah, really, I do like them. And they're like, you throw them and you can make them turn left and right and like barrel roll. And I'm like, no way got to see this. So that you're, you're my brother. Someone just actually super chatted, which doesn't happen all the time. Uh, but oh, I have Zen. a couple. All right. I'm going to stop you if it gets too embarrassing, but someone said, let's hear all the embarrassing Matt stories. And I promise we're going to get to disc golf coverage in just a minute, but I wanted to intro you to my brother who's joined the show tonight. Josh, what do you got? All right. So I'm not going to draw this out, although I've got plenty. So maybe some separate Venmo, not none of this. Um, you know, super chat that I don't get. So if you want to send it to me, I'll give you the real stuff. Uh, no, Matt, the brief one I will tell you also used to be really into kite flying. <laughs> Did you know I was going here? No. Okay. I don't, I mean, this is embarrassing. It's also kind of just funny. Um, I'll keep it brief. <laughs> Matt decides he's going to fly a kite because he's really into this. It's not a windy day. So what do you do as a kid? You run, right? So you create the velocity in the wind by running, but you also want to watch your kite. Right. So what do you do? You run full speed ahead while watching your kite behind you. And here comes Matt literally right. He, he turns forward, running full speed right into the side of our house, like full speed into the side of the house, like knock yourself down, like bloody face, <laughs> uh, probably a little bit of crying. OK, here, here's the best part of the story, in my opinion, because that's kind of embarrassing. It's not over. He decides I'm going to go to the giant parking lot that's just around the corner from our house because it's wide open there. I can do it safely. Finally recovered after the initial collision, decides run full speed, the kite's flying, and there's one vehicle parked in the parking lot, which is a pickup truck. Matt runs full speed into the bumper on that pickup truck, lays him out, bloody face again, runs all the way home uh, screaming and crying while I'm sitting there just <laughs> laughing. No, let me fill in the actual details. So the first story is accurate the way it went. I did run into the house. And if you want to set it up, I'll set it up a little worse. I tripped right on the edge of a garden bed, which was about three or four feet off of the house. So it like tripped me. So I was leaning head first into the house. Yes, that happened. I did go to the parking lot. That's number two. I did hit the side of a truck bed and I can still hear the echo to this day, like in my head. And I remember bleeding and it felt like pins and needles all over my face. But here's the part that you forgot to mention. 
you said I ran home screaming and crying, which I think I was crying. <laughs> but my older brother, Josh, sitting on the other side of the table from me, he starts patting me on the shoulder and says, oh, tough up, toughen up, Matt, toughen up. You'll be fine. Just telling me to be uh, tough. And you were fine all these years later. Here we are. Yep. So that is our relationship. Um, so let's get into a little bit of talk here. I'm sure if the super chats keep coming in, maybe we'll get to some more. <laughs> Has nothing to do with disc golf. But, <laughs> but let's talk about uh, what did we just see? The United States, by the way, the acronym tournaments are great, right? US WDGC. And then we had the US JDGC and USD. Anyways. U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship, uh, they had a record attendance, 263 FPO players at this event. Josh, that's nearly 100 over their best before that. What does that tell you, if anything, about what's happened since COVID, the pandemic? Oh, well, we've seen this everywhere, right? So tournaments selling out quickly, event sizes. Um, what is awesome is it's carrying over to the FPO side of the game. Um, not only we're going to talk about it, but like the performance seems to be rising because there's an influx of more players, but also just pure numbers. Yeah. 263, um, total across. I, oh man, I don't know if we have this stat. I'm going to say 16 divisions possibly. Um, I think there were 62 players in FPO. Um, all these are awesome numbers to see. And I think we'll talk about it, but it was really cool to see an FPO. Well, actually I shouldn't say that a women's focused event where the performance was high and it was exciting to watch. So I hope that, uh, I think it tells us things about where the sport will continue to go. Yeah, and I want to shout out to Stat Mando. Again, if you would go check them out on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is where they are hosted currently, but I can't disclose it fully until they give me the go-ahead. They've got some big plans, uh, some really cool, like I said, I feel like if you're into stats, it's going to be revolutionary to the way you find disc golf stats. Uh, stay tuned for that. But shout out to Stat Mando. So let's get into the, some of the stats here. The basic events, uh, obviously, you can go grab those anywhere. But we're going to get to some notable stats that are just like worth mentioning. So just to to bring it right to it, Paige Pierce, first place. If you didn't know it, now you do. Um, 22 under par. Uh, second place going to Haley King, 9 under. You guys know this. But the interesting part was the battle between Ella Hansen, who we're going to have on the show later. Uh, We'll talk about this a little bit, but she took third place, Missy Gannon fourth, tied for fifth, notable name, Holly Finley and Katrina Allen tied for fifth. Um, so Josh, in general, um, what did you think of the performance that you saw? Were you able to catch it live this week? I was able to catch some of it live. I also had a son who had his 10th birthday party and that was somewhat of a priority, but I've been back and, and, and skimmed through much of it. Yeah, it, um, it was interesting coming out of round one, right? Also, by the way, there was a lot of talk coming into this event about three courses, three days, kind of a lot of buzz. So just really wanted to see how it played out. Round one played out maybe the way I thought it would um, on the leaderboard. Round round two, right? All of a sudden, it really cinched up, Matt, the scores. But the top two really separated themselves. And I think this statement I'm about to make is probably not really the right way to say it, but Paige is back. And I say, the, I say why it's not the right way to say it. I'm not sure she ever really wasn't back, right? As far as the grand scheme of things, we love to inflate it. She obviously struggled in the first part of the year. I think from a storyline standpoint, it feels like she's back. And how about a stamp of approval? I mean, one of her quotes, she literally said, I couldn't feel better. Yeah. And she slayed, she slayed the competition. Now, I mean, Haley was there, right? And round three was kind of a little off and weird, but I mean... It, it was exciting to see, but it was really a, a two-person race, right? A two-woman race to the end, and Paige out-sprinted everybody down the backstretch. Yeah, so it was two going into round three, and very quickly it became a one-horse race, and then it turned into Ella Hansen, yeah. Haley King. It went the opposite way I, for Haley. Yeah. And Ella Hansen became a conversation of, wow, this is a very new player to the scene. We're going to talk about it. We're having her on the show later. Um, but let's talk some of the in, like the notables here. So Paige Pierce obviously took first. Um, she got first in everything but circle two putting. And the difference between that and second place or whatever here, let me look at. She got two out of 17 from circle two and first place got three out of 17. So she's like tied for second as far as that goes. But everything else, T 
to green, gained putting. Uh, listen to this. Gain T to green. 22 strokes. That's how well she's playing Iron Crows. Um, let's look at Ella Hansen shooting well over her rating, uh, beyond her average, of course. It 22nd, though, gained in putting. So putting was her issue. But yeah, I think that that's really what stands out to me about why she didn't place higher, but her throwing. Yeah, I mean, Matt. Look at her throwing. Yeah, so Ella is a new name, whether you've been around the sport or not, because she's really just joined the scene. I think uh, we'll talk to her and probably get a little more insight into this, but I think you're talking like less than eight months in the game, right? Maybe less than seven months playing tournaments. Um, And you're probably talking like two or three months of like, FBO competition. And, uh, and so I, I recognized her name before this event because we heard it at a couple prior events. Um, OTB, I think Paige was talking about who's this Ella out throwing me and, uh, yeah. What is that going to mean for the game? If she, if people like her and she herself come out and really blow this away, she can throw far. Yeah. She can throw far. All right. So here are some more notables. Thank you. Stat Mando for these. This is Paige Pierce's her event rating, okay, event means average over the three rounds, 1,020, if we're being really detailed, 1,020.67, almost 1,021 event rating. Listen to this. Take this and tell your friends. Be, be really important with your friends. <laughs> this was the best FPO major event rating ever. So the average of these ratings over the three rounds, best ever for an FPO major, and that beats out Val Jenkins, which had a 1,000 rated um, 2011 U.S. Women's um, and Paige Pierce, her previously before that, she had a 998, but 1,020 is enough to be the highest ever FPO major rating, event yeah. rating. Yeah, what, what's crazy about that, right? So we're talking FPO majors, which there have been plenty of them, right? Every year we've got several, at least two or three, depending on the year, maybe more. Um, Matt, to beat that by not like, you know, marginal as usually ratings, right? They kind of slowly creep up. She blew it away by 20 strokes. So, uh, yeah, when I say, again, Paige is back, um, I'm being a little facetious because one event, we shouldn't overreact, but maybe it's even like a new and improved Paige. I mean, that is a crazy score in a major. That's awesome. Yeah, it really is. So here's a few others now that are worth sharing. Let's go down to Haley King because she had an outstanding performance for round two. Outstanding. Putting her only, she shot better than Paige. And she was only two back going into round three. Uh, so here's here's some cool stats. Thanks to Stat Mando. Kings, 1,038 rated round two was her best round rating ever. Okay, so Haley shot her best round rating ever. Be interesting to hear how she felt about that round. <laughs> um, also, you ready for this? 1,038 rated round two is the second best, second, not first, really close, second best major FPO rating. And you know who had the highest ever FPO rating at a major, an FPO major? You can see it there. It's Katrina Allen. She shot 1,058 uh, round seven. Hear that? Round seven at Worlds. That's not often we hear round seven. But so she shot an amazing, almost historical, just shy of getting there with Katrina Allen first ever at a major. Um, But here's the storyline, Josh. Her round rating swing from round two to round three was the largest round rating swing she's ever had. So, oh, you could see it too. I mean, Matt, I mean, you yeah. know, we're talking about the stats and let's keep going there, but you could just see it. I mean, like it felt like the air was just kind of let out of the the sails for her cuz it coming into that round, I mean, all of a sudden Haley King who just threw down a scorcher and Haley King is like the new name on the scene, you know, new relatively speaking, uh pushing in I'm like, here we go for round three, right? This is going to be it. We're going to see him duke it out. And yeah, talk about a swing. I mean, Haley fell down. Yeah, it was unfortunate. I think we were talking this before the show. You mentioned how much emotion we saw in her stepping up to the tee pad on the 18. And before that, her head down, more or less, you say, in her palm of her hands. Like it was just, she was something was, it was emotionally distressful for her. Yeah. Is but, how it appeared. Yeah. And again, it, it would be complete speculation because oh, any of us who have played disc golf know there's literally so many things that can happen. Sometimes it's just the way the disc flies sometimes. Right. But on the tee box on round three, 
Haley is not famous for showing like emotion now, right? She's a human. We know she has it. She's talked about it, right? She's competitive. She wants to win, but it, it appeared, this is Josh's speculation. How do I really know? I wasn't even there, but it appeared that on her face, there was a little bit more like pressure. Um, and when we think about it, she has won several NTs, the pro tour championship, um, but we may be giving her more credit for experience on the big stage than she actually has. And she's still learning that. Uh, I think her skill is still literally at this point in the elite club. Um, there's no question about it, but a little bit of inhale and exhalation seemed a little bit. And what happened to her first throw? And that seemed to set the stage, right? That first throw, a little bit of a shank. And again, like we said, it literally no looking back for Paige. Like it never even got yeah. close after that. I was just going to say, and then Paige's first throw was like, here I am. Perfect. I'm going to do this. You have to come. And, right. and actually Paige Perfect. said it. It was more or less, it, she didn't say it was over, but that's what she implied. She said after the first two holes, it was going to be very hard. Yeah. If not impossible. So a few other quick storylines to talk about here before we get in Simon Lazat, who's coming up soon here in just a few minutes, actually, um, is, I mean, we talked about Ella, we've talked about Haley's finish there. I think notable here, and it's unfortunate sometimes to do this, but Kona Panis, you ready for this? Kona Panis, and thanks to Stat Mando for this stat, Kona Panis was first in fairway hits. Ready? First, she was second in circle one regulation. Uh, first in circle two regulation. These are a lot of good numbers. But she was 56th in circle one X putts and 49th in circle two putts. So she lost nearly six strokes on the field from putting. And that was with her gaining almost 21 strokes for all of her driving effort. She was doing amazing tee to green. She was barely behind Paige. I mean, literally, she was almost yes. putting Paige numbers on tee to green. And so, and exactly. And then putting, remember, there's 62 players in the field? Yeah. And she was 57. 50, yeah. So, that is tough. If you take what she missed, she only had to, and I don't mean, if Kona, you're listening, I mean this in a positive way, where how close you are. But had you just shot average, and I say you as if she's listening, <laughs> if you... Here we go again. If she just shot average putting, average, whatever the event average was for the putting, if she had just done that, she would have had second place outright, second place outright, just from doing average putting. So I don't, we, we actually might talk about this later after we get on some of our guests. At what point does an, a touring professional disc golfer change up their mechanics, their mindset, their stroke, however you want to call it. At what point do you do it? Do you do it in the middle of a season? We'll talk about that later. Um, as we get ready to bring Simon in, uh, Josh, do you want to kind of hit on the interesting stat here with cash per throw for Paige Pierce, if you remember what that stat was? Yeah, give me a look, and then yeah, you, then you can move on. So, you know, dollar per throw... <laughs> I think Nick has always brought this up as an interesting stat that he's found interesting. It's really just kind of a fun type of stat, meaning in reality, there's, there's too many variables to actually make it meaningful, but it's still intriguing. Um, this was Paige's highest per, per throw payout of her whole career. I think the payout was 4,400, um, and it was a three-round event, and she threw 22 under par. Do the math, $30.17 per throw met her prior uh, highest uh, payout was $21.24 per throw at 2017 Worlds. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, it, interesting enough, Haley King, and, and by the way, we talked about how she had such a horrible third round, meaning the biggest swing ever in her for like a rating between rounds. She still finished second, barely, but uh, that just shows how strong her second round was. But even for her, this was her highest payout um, ever per throw um, at an event. So it's just interesting to see the growth of the sport, growth of competition, growth of payouts. Um, well, and I, I, I was bringing Simon into the room. I'm not sure if I heard this, but did you say, well, it's a three round event. So it makes sense, right? That she shot the highs. Did you talk about that? Yeah, I mentioned it's a three round event. So if you take in, let's just say, okay, well, let's make it a four round event, add 54 strokes just to be like, Hey, let's get an average. What did she get per throw? If you just do something basic like that, she's still outperformed cash per throw. So that stat, 
for those of you who are like screaming, that doesn't matter. It's literally just a fun stat. Like it's just one to hear a number. That's it. Um, but so she performed extremely well. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, is there anything else we're missing? You mentioned Kings. Oh, and we're going to bring on Ella Hansen later here, but Hansen's first cash over a thousand. She's coming into the sport at the right time. Is that something to say? I feel like that's something to say. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, anybody who's joining the sport, I mean, Matt, what's, what is the right time you can define? Cause by the way, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you might've felt like it was the right time. But uh, with this perspective we've got, it feels like it's certainly the growth. If you want to win money, if you want to be popular, if you want good competition, if you want to have to earn your wins, this is the right time, right? If you want to, if you want media, if you want, you know, all these things that come along with it. Yeah, this is the right time. That's for sure. All right. So I think it's time. We've got someone on the show that I think is worth bringing in and leaving them not out in the cold. Or actually, it's summer up here in New England now. Let's go ahead and bring him in. Simon Lazad, everybody. Welcome to the show, Simon. It's been too long. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. Uh, I don't think I've ever met your bro brother, Matt, so maybe we have met. I don't know, but nice to meet you. Yeah, I don't know. I've been around MVP or Maple Hill a few times, but I don't know. We probably did meet at one point, but nice to yeah, officially say we've met. Good to see you on screen. Um, where, are you, where are you at? Are you home? There's a freaking vacuum behind me. Oh my god, fail! <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm home. I flew home right after the OTB Open, just because I still feel like we just recently bought this house, and I have like so many things to do that are non disc golf related here at home. Just trying to figure out the house life. But uh, yeah, also I, you know I can't play disc golf every day right now still because of my elbow. So I'm coming home to take breaks that I need. Yeah. And so that's actually, I mean, besides, you know, we enjoy talking to you. That was a big part of why we wanted to bring you on the show was to talk about your reaction to how it went. I mean, can you explain to us like the plane flight there and the day before, like, were you, get, did you have nerves? Were they happy? Feel, like just walk us through that leading up to the event itself. Yeah. I mean, of course, some nerves before the first round, but uh, in the practice days, super easy. It was so awesome. We The weather we had was so perfect. We got really lucky. I heard it's like a super windy place normally, so it was like unusual for it to be so calm and perfect. A bit hot in the practice rounds, but no, it was so amazing seeing everyone again and playing practice rounds with Eagle. And I played around with Ella as well, who did amazingly last weekend, uh, who's going to be on the show soon. So that's exciting to watch. And man, I had such a good time. The OTB guys were amazing. We hung out at their warehouse almost every night, just tasting beers and doing fun putting games through the disc racks, having free food for us. It was all, all a great experience. And I was so impressed. Out After I've heard a couple like mixed opinions on Stockton as a city, I was like so positively surprised and like relieved that it was actually really nice. So it was a great experience. And then before round one, man, I don't remember the last time I was so nervous <laughs> teeing off on the first hole. Um, I think my scorecard kind of shows that. And if, if you actually watched it live, my tee shot on one was okay, but my second and third shot were like two of the worst shots. It was nervous <laughs> shots I've ever thrown, I think. So yeah, it took me a, it took me a good like 30, 45 minutes or something to get back in the flow of things and I ended up shooting a decent round and I actually averaged my rating for the whole tournament so overall I guess at least what I discussed with my therapist and with Seth uh, from Disc Golf Strong on site it was definitely a success just because it was such a big course with so many holes that are like a distance contest basically and I tweaked my elbow like very very slightly in round one a couple times I think because of nerves and just like over excitement it was hard to like really control my emotions that much and after that I really had to be more disciplined and really like focus on my movements and don't try to be too aggressive or want too much because it's so easy to get carried away especially if I know what I can do usually so yeah that course was maybe not the best decision to come back to but it was overall a success and a good test for the elbow. And the fact that I made it through without even having to consider dropping out or anything like that, it was definitely all in all very good. 
Yeah. Short answer. <laughs> Fantastic answer. I'd rather not have to talk as much and just let you have the show. Actually, put it in full disclosure. I asked Simon to be a co-host and I was like, do it. Do it. You be the full <laughs> co-host. And he's like, no. Dude, I, I would have done it. I was just so busy and I didn't really keep up yeah. with recent <laughs> stories and events. I kind of followed the U.S. women's. Yeah. Um, I watched the final round. Like I was playing pool with a friend at the same time. So I was kind of like watching it. But uh, I was definitely excited to see Ella and Paige was like at the end running away with it anyway. So it wasn't too exciting score wise at the end. But uh, so I didn't feel like fully prepared That's enough okay. to step on there and co-host. That's OK. Um, I, I would have set you up. I would have fed you some good stuff. <laughs> All right. So, Simon, you talk a lot about nerves um, playing again, which I think in its own right, right, with your break, with the injury, you may have had some nerves. But I'm, you're also used to being in front of a camera, everything from your vlog. Here you are on the show. You've been on plenty of lead card and feature card coverages. But here's the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Welcome back. We're going to put you on feature card. Plus, you have fans anyway who are just excited to see you back. Did that add to the nerves or was it self-imposed nerves or was it all this extra hype surrounding it that ratcheted it up for you? I think everything is kind of self-imposed to an extent. I mean... I know everyone out there watching me and everyone watching from home, like they all just want me to do well. They're all, or at least almost all probably <laughs> excited to see me back and just like no pressure from anyone else. So all the pressure that I felt was coming from myself. I I had to remind myself of that because of course I, I was thinking, man, the pressure is up now. And I definitely felt it. And I knew I was going to be on my car like two weeks before uh, that event. And I thought about it for a couple of days <laughs> and I kind of wanted to say no thank you just to have like an easier start. Like it is crazy <laughs> how much different it is to play on a live card with Ricky and Sexton with like five cameras on you at all time and like a bigger gallery than you would have in like any other card. Um, and I knew it probably wasn't a smart choice to do that, but I couldn't say no because I felt not. like like I kind of like I got to do it, I guess. So, I, I know it was going to hurt me, but I still had to say yes. Well, and that's what I was just going to ask, but you kind of just answered it. You said you knew it was going to yeah. hurt you. Did it hurt you? You felt like that's where those nerves came from in that round? Or would I, would you have had those nerves regardless, like live feed or not, coming back after so long off? I think it definitely hurt okay. me. It hurt me. I added pressure, like probably from myself, but it still added pressure. And I tweaked my elbow two or three times like on the first six or seven holes and i don't think i would have done that if i didn't feel those nerves or like the adrenaline rushes that the whole thing gave me so i definitely definitely uh did not help okay but uh i don't know i don't really know you know it's like yeah. whatever yeah it's like whatever you actually yeah you performed i think i loved I loved how I texted you. I don't know. It was the day after. And you just said, not too shabby. Cause I was asking how you felt. And I, I was like, that seems like a good description, <laughs> not too shabby. So is that how you feel about your overall performance? Is that like generally? Yeah. You, you know, you make like to reach your full goal of winning like a big event, you do like baby steps towards that. And, um, I see how well Casey has been playing this whole season. So my one goal this tournament <laughs> was, I want to beat Casey <laughs> And uh, Brody Smith is obviously a guy that's been playing so well this year, like surprisingly well. And he's always, even though he's just a guy at the end of the day, it's kind of still like he still has like this special kind of factor to it. <laughs> and I really didn't want Brody to beat me on this m massive course. Um, so he was beating me after two rounds. So for my final run, I was like, I was just you disking, like seeing what Brody's doing and trying to beat Brody that day. That was just like a fun little competition for myself, but I thought you were going to say like, ah, screw the elbow. I got to beat Brody and just go like all out. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, another thing that happened with my elbow, I got, I think I was a bit overconfident because in the practice rounds that I played with Eagle, um, I had zero issues and whole practice rounds. I had zero problems with my elbow. And I thought like, man, maybe I'm like fine again. So I think I pushed myself a bit harder in the actual round than I did in practice, which was not a good idea, which I instantly felt it was not a good idea. We, but uh, yeah, and all in all, I was, I was very happy with my putting, especially my putting. I was shocked that I actually made a lot of great putts. Interesting. Uh, one of the notes you just said is like, 
you ratcheted it up like, or uh, I forget how you said it, but when you actually went from practice to performance and that happened all the time when I'd play in a band, you'd practice one way, but the live energy is totally different. Even show audio tests. I'll get guests in here and we'll do audio tests. And then when the show goes live, everyone talks louder. Um, so yeah, you definitely experienced that is what I'm hearing. Um, so what's your next event after this one? Are you going out to Santa Cruz? I'm actually playing a local event here on Saturday. It is at uh, Sunny Mead. You might know the place. It's like uh, 45 minutes south of Boston. And Rivas, shout out Team Discmania. He is uh, running that event. It's a B tier. It's a one day B tier. So I'm pretty excited for that. The weather here has been also amazing. So I hope we get lucky for that weekend as well. And uh, what day that's is going to that? be like a warm up. That's Saturday. Uh, what day is that? The okay. 29th? Yeah, maybe I'll have to grab your vlog camera. We'll no, talk. I was just going to say, he, wait, Simon's entering event. We need to put him on feature card live coverage first round. We're going to be out there. Five cameras. I, I wonder if they're going to have media there. I, I'm, I'm supposed to do something Simon, at I, Maple Hill. They were they reached out to me originally, and I actually said I was busy. But that's I don't know if they actually got somebody. I might it might be cool to have like a little caddy cam or something going we'll, and like cut, we'll talk. cut some highlights. Yeah, we'll talk about that. They'll be but, like, you said you, they'll say, you said you were busy. <laughs> be like, yeah, I was. I, I was. Yeah, okay. Um, so you're coming, but the next Pro Portland. Tour event. Yeah, Portland Open. I'm flying out on Monday right after the event. Um, I'm actually getting my second shot for the vaccine on Sunday. Ooh. Um, this Sunday. And then, then Monday, I'm flying to Portland. So I really hope I'm one of the lucky ones <laughs> yeah. that don't get these crazy side effects for the second one. Um, so that might be a bit risky. So I hope everything goes well. And then I'm flying back after Portland to Boston, right after Portland. Say, but I'll be home for like 10 days ish. I have a lot of stuff to do again in those 10 <laughs> days and never stops. So, and then we're flying back to Salt Lake city for worlds. Is this imposing of me to ask? I think you're engaged, correct? Correct. Okay. So through the pandemic and your injury, you were at home a whole bunch. How yeah. does your how does your significant other feel about like all of a sudden like it's it's not even full blown your back but like you're back you're traveling a lot is that hard? It, it's definitely tough because especially with a house because she actually she's been like city hopping basically for the last eight years of her life I think eight different apartments in the last eight years mm. so the house life with four bedrooms three bathrooms <laughs> it's like so different it, it's so crazily different. And she feels very, I don't want to say lonely, but kind of lonely and a bit scared in this, in this house sometimes. But uh, <laughs> just more reasons for me to come home every now and then, which I kind of need for myself anyway. Yeah, that's straight up. And you just said like lonely. I have an embarrassing story. My wife probably is like, don't share it. But like when we first got married, I was out on like a weekend trip or something. And I came home one night late. And no joke, all the lights were on in the whole house. The TVs were all on. And she was like yep. sitting in the middle of the house. And like, this is where it gets funny to me. She had her pocket knife in her hand. <laughs> oh my God. And it's like, I, I get it. So like, yeah. but, but anyway, so that's, you'll, you'll work through that. I hope. <laughs> but, um, so she has four cats to protect. There her, you go. So we're good. Four cats. <laughs> awesome. You have four little boys. <laughs> now I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was all part of the plan. That was all part of the plan. Okay. So as we get ready to wrap up this interview here, thank you so much for coming on. Um, what should we ask Ella? If anything stood out, you got to play a practice round with her. I've got a whole bunch of questions, but like what stands out to you that you can share with us? Did you watch my vlog with her or no? Yes. Yeah. So I already, I already course it, uh, asked the hard hitting questions. <laughs> um, no, but She's she's super cool. I think she's 25 and she just discovered disc golf a year ago. She's an ultimate freaking legend. And I mean, she played in the age protected division, but still um, she was team captain for the U.S. team, which is pretty sick. And man, she can throw. And once she figures out how disc golf works and she gets the confidence going with the short game, she's going to be like a top three contender, I think, on like a very regular basis. So I'm. I don't know what to ask her. Just that's a hot take. Ask, I don't know. I would like to know more about her like future plans with like a full time disc golf job. I just kind of like very shortly asked that question, but maybe she has after this event like more plans because she actually saw like yeah I can do this. Yeah, Josh, you have anything you want to wrap up with here? Any thoughts? 
Oh, just general thoughts, Simon. I mean, everybody's happy to see you back. Uh, I think everybody is looking forward to you doing it the right way, meaning getting out there, taking care of the elbow. Um, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, I want to ask, right, so what are your expectations going into Pro Worlds? Mm. Uh, I was actually thinking about that today. Um, I was doing some yard work, listening to a podcast, and kind of going through what I think about Worlds. I haven't played that course. I only played one of the two courses we're playing for Worlds, like, five or six years ago now. Uh, I don't know the courses, so I don't really know what to expect. And man, the 1050 boys are just so hard to even think about beating <laughs> right now, especially with a handicap being my elbow. So for me, like the dream, I don't want to say expectations, but the number one goal would be like right behind the 1050 boys, like in fifth or sixth place. Um, definitely man, like a top 10. If the, if the courses play anything towards where it's a lot of about position to play and you don't really need that super sonic drive on every hole, then um, I think a top 10 is possible because I'll prepare. I'll be ready. Well, I, uh, we, can't, we can't take up the whole show with Simon, and I know you're a busy guy. We'll have to catch up. I'll reach out about this weekend. I don't know what's up for sure. Is this a holiday weekend, technically? Is this Memorial Day? or Next week, I think. Oh, it's the next one? I don't know. No, this coming weekend is Memorial Day. Well, oh, Monday. Because the yeah, following, yeah, yeah mon Monday is Memorial Day, so yes. And so your tournament's this weekend? That is right. Okay, I'll, I'll reach out. We'll see if we can make something happen. I don't know. All right. That'd be sick. All right, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Simon. Totally appreciate it. We'll have you on again. Uh, look forward to seeing you around. Good luck out there. Peace. Good night. Peace. All right, everybody. That was Simon Lazat giving us the lowdown. Josh, did anything stand out to you at all about that? Like, just generally, did he answer your question satisfactory? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, I literally wasn't just saying it because we're sitting here talking to him. Everybody's excited to see him back. Um, finishing, I think it was 13th place. I don't know if we specifically said that, but mm. that's, um, you know, I think that's decent performance. I mean, obviously some people might've expected more, maybe some people expected less. I get a little bit <coughs> nervous hearing, you know, that Simon is still Simon. This is a good thing, by the way, this is why people like him, but he wants to show he's a showman. Right. And so he felt that right? Like yeah. he, he felt it and he felt the tweak. I think I'm really happy that it seemed to uh, be that he's recognizing the importance of taking care of this for the longevity of his competition. Um, but we all love Simon because we like that Simon likes us. <laughs> we, we'll say that again. No, we like Simon because Simon likes, likes, likes the fans. Right. He likes to do it for the fans. And of course, I mean, he gets fulfillment. He wants to win. Right. He wants to compete. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. But he likes to do it for the fans, which we love. That's why uh, we love that about Simon. So heal up that elbow. Um, I agree. The, the what he, the 1050 boys are going to be hard to beat. But um, he takes it serious. He's still one of the best in the game. Ah, we're all rooting for him. It's like people all the time are like, man, Simon is like never upset. And I just want to tell you this. Simon is a human. We got to encourage him along the way, but man, he's a positive attitude. That's what we can say. <clears throat> All right, everybody. So next up on the show, we do have another interview prior to Ella Hansen. And I know we've got people. Come on, bring on Ella. <laughs> it is out there in the chat. But there is something called the Paul Macbeth Foundation. We've talked about it. We've had Paul on here. Paul Macbeth. He's talked about it. They had a project this past weekend um, where they installed a course down in Mexico. If you followed social media, you got to watch some of that. Um, we tried, we tried to line up Paul Macbeth himself, but everybody, <laughs> we got the bigger name for the Paul Macbeth Foundation, the executive, so the man in charge, the, man, <laughs> the executive director of the Paul Macbeth Foundation. Uh, let's introduce you to him now with all joking aside, Dustin Leatherman. How's it going, man? Hey, what an introduction, Matt. It's great. <laughs> Hey, you know, credit where credit's due. It's good to talk to you again, Dustin. We've worked and crossed paths in disc golf for years. We're bringing you on the show now to talk about uh, the Paul Macbeth Foundation's recent project in, if I'm saying it correctly, La Paz, Mexico. You want to tell us just a little bit about that, what the project entailed, and feel free to just elaborate what you guys got to, what you did, anything that uniquely stood out. And if you get stuck, we have some questions for you. 
All right, that sounds good. Yeah, we went. Uh, we traveled down with a team of five of or seven of us actually, um, including Paul, and we traveled to La Paz, and we were working with a ranch that has a bunch of youth programs and works with um, youth in the surrounding area. Uh, it's called Rancho El Camino, and we put in a nine-hole disc golf course for them. Uh, it was really cool property, uh, very desert-like. Uh, check you can check out our Instagram page or our Facebook page to. Uh, kind of just see some of the terrain. Uh, but yeah, we spent all week. We all flew in on Monday. We got there Tuesday. Uh, Paul took the lead on designing the course, set up this really super fun beginner course with the opportunity to uh, expand it into like a more intermediate or advanced course in the future. And nine holes. Um, the team was awesome. And the, the staff there was great. So they actually, uh, one of the cool things about the project is they, they hired um, a number of youth from La Paz, to, which is part of what they do. They, they try to give jobs and opportunities to, to young people that might not have them otherwise. Uh, so they actually were able to, to create jobs for this week that um, a bunch of youth were out there working alongside us. Uh, it was kind of cool. You know, the beginning of the week, nobody knew who Paul was down there. And then, you know, as he continues to get introduced as the five-time world champion, you know, people are you know, wanted to get his autograph and, you know, but it was cool because he just got to work right alongside them. Um, and yeah, so we spent our time putting in this course and then teaching clinics to their staff, teaching clinics to the youth. Um, and then another cool component as the word got out that we were putting in this course, people from La Paz, um, most of the people from Canada and Mexico uh, and the U.S. that are living there now, um, started sending us messages like, Hey, can I come out and help? Can I come out and, um, play the course? So we, you know, not only were we teaching the youth and interacting with kind of their, the people that they normal, normally work with, but other people from the surrounding area were already starting to come out and say, man, I've, I've been living here and it's awesome, but I've been missing disc golf and now there's a disc golf course. So it was just, it was really cool on a lot of different levels and the product went super smooth. Um, we we have a number of like we're working with most of the manufacturers to put in these courses um and then other companies in disc golf uh, one of our goals is to just work with as many people as possible uh so in this this case we worked with dynamic discs so a lot of people were asking questions like why is it dynamic and you know not paul's other sponsors discraft and um you know we want to work with everybody so this this project specifically was with dynamic discs and they were awesome they sent baskets in advance they sent nine veterans and then two portables and we sent about 100 discs then we brought about 100 extras um and we were a little worried they were stuck in Tijuana for a while um and we just kept you know we're watching the tracking and they're they're stuck there for like three or four weeks uh, but they made it about a week and a half before we got there um, put the course in, uh, it was, it was great. And then the excitement and enthusiasm from kids to the kids, parents to, you know, even older people in the community was just super cool to see. They were, you know, they were loving it. They loved interacting with Paul. Uh, Paul was fantastic just, you know, as he normally is in terms of just, uh, just being a, a normal guy and, and interacting with, um, everybody from the ranch and, uh, it was just a great week. And the cool thing uh, for, for everybody at home is uh, Joe Mez is one of our, our big partners as an organization. And they sent two guys um, to just film the whole thing. So they filmed Paul um, playing the course. They filmed um, they filmed just the whole experience. So they're going to do kind of like a documentary style video. Uh, so there should be some really cool um you know, documentation of the, of the trip coming out as well. Awesome. That is a lot going on. And I'm sure that's a, actually a pretty significant project for Jomez, which everyone should be on the lookout for. That's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that you just said that I thought was kind of interesting and it actually struck me in like a wow kind of way, and it, but it makes sense. Uh, the, the locals, the children, whoever around there didn't know who Paul Macbeth was. And we're installing a disc golf course. So did they know what disc golf was? No, it was cool. The, the camp director had a concept of it. Um, so we had been talking since probably like February about this project. And he knew about it. And they're the kind of like organization that they have 
like people that come and serve, like maybe, you know, young people that do a gap year or do an internship and they come and serve. So occasionally they've had disc golfers, um, you know, come in and participate and, um, you know, do something with it. But uh, the camp director said most of the people that we were teaching that week, it was the first time they ever threw a disc or a Frisbee, which was really awesome. Yeah, that's great. So what was, you talked about this a little bit, but um, what was the vibe on the ground amongst the team who went? So I think you said there was a team of like, what did you say seven? I forget. And who was that comprised? Yeah. Who was that comprised of? So you, Paul, did you include Joe Mez? Like, what was that project team like? And uh, what was the experience like working together? Yeah, it actually came together amazingly well. Um, initially, it was just you know the plan to have a small team, me, Paul, and then uh, Doug Bjerkis and his wife came from Dynamic. So fresh off, you know, all that he did with the DDO, Doug wanted to come down and you know make sure this first project went well. Doug's uh, the co-chairman of our board of directors. Um, and as you know, just a great guy, does a lot of good stuff for the sport. So he wanted to be there. Uh, so he actually came down with his wife for, for part of it. They kind of combined vacation and um, helping us out. And then a couple weeks before the trip, Paul's like, oh, I had an idea. Let, let's bring uh, Joey Tamale on the trip. So Joey came down, uh, which was fantastic because he speaks fluent uh, Spanish. Uh, they had translators ready, but it was cool to just have Joey and Paul kind of leading clinics together and, and Joey just translating. Um, and then another, you know, touring pro disc golfer that's out there playing regularly and um, has some great abilities to, to kind of teach. So, uh, and then, yeah, Joe Mez sent two guys. Um, so for me, I actually, you know, first time I met Joey, first time I met Raul from, you know, that was representing Joe Mez. Um, first time I'd worked with Ryan and uh, it was it was just great. The team got along well, and it just seemed like all the pieces came together really well. And it just was the ranch was the perfect partner. They were really laid back, but really like enthusiastic. So they were flexible with whatever we needed to do, um, but they were just really enthusiastic about the project. And it was just you know it just, everything just came together and worked out really well. Well, I'm I'm hopeful that, you know, one day we'll, we'll look back at this and, you know, see maybe a U.S. champ or a, a world's champ and they'll say, yeah, I got my very first introduction to disc golf when this, this guy who they used to say was the goat, <laughs> you know, came and built a course, right, uh, at, at my local camp. So I think it, it's really, really exciting. Um, and I know there's all different ways to support the foundation, uh, Dustin. I'm sure a lot of that can be found on the website, various donation services, um, but yeah, are there more trips planned like this in the future? Like if people are clamoring to go hang out with Paul himself, do you expect him to be literally the course planter on every single, um, you know, trip that's out there, Paul himself laying, you know, foundations for all these, uh, discs or what's the future of this kind of course planting look like for the foundation? Yeah, great question. So we are actually having a, a board meeting tomorrow and our board of directors is very actively involved in project, uh, decision-making. So, We've had, I would say, well over 100 project requests. Um, and uh, so I do, you know, sort through them, figure out what best fits our mission. And a lot of them do. But so it, it's really, really difficult to select these projects. But um, we plan to do at minimum three uh, in 2021. Um, we may do four or five, uh, depending on how, you know, things come together. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to take Paul every time. You know, you guys both know Paul, and I know he wants to be there. He wants to be hands-on. He wants to do the work. Like, when we were there, he wasn't just like, hey, you know, do this and do that. He was, like, using a pickaxe, and I'm like, <laughs> whoa, you know, maybe take it easy. we got a tournament next week. But um, he was, you know, he's doing the work. So I think what our plan will be, some of our projects are like like this one with La Paz, where we're working with an organization that, like, knows they want this golf, doesn't know a lot about it. Some of the other projects we're talking to and deciding between are places that have no disc golf courses in their country, but they have like these really dedicated individuals that love disc golf and take out portable baskets and do clinics and teaching and set up like temp courses. Um, so those projects, we won't need to be as hands on and it'll be more about funding. It'll be more about, um, you know, just getting them the resources that they need and, um, our hope is that any course we put in, Paul will visit at some point, um, but it might be like, you know, courses go in and then 
uh, Paul does like a little world tour where he's stopping in and checking out and doing some clinic, some teaching. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll kind of ha- approach it in different ways as we go. Um, but again, Paul wants to be involved and, and, you know, is not just a foundation with his name on it, but it, he is very actively involved in all aspects of it, which is really cool. So yeah. And then in terms of getting, getting involved, you know, as we grow, we have more opportunities to to get involved. You know, like we we took a small team that came together, um, but certainly we have these manufacturers that are donating, which is awesome. But we've had a bunch of disc golfers donate. Um, we've we've sold some merchandise. We sold some discs as fundraisers, um, and we we even putting up auctions every time we announce a project, and just a number of ways to just support the, the projects and we can't say enough about how the community has embraced it, supported it. And, you know, basically the more funds that we can raise, the more opportunities we'll have to put in courses. And I, I think on your, your show, Paul announced that he's donating all his winnings from this year, um, which sounds like a lot, but as you do these things, you know, the money piles up. So um, we'll need to continue to fundraise and, you know, <laughs> we want to do as much as we can and just provide disc golf. Um, to as many kind of underserved places that have no access to it as possible. So how does a conversation like that go as the executive director of Paul Macbeth Foundation? Hey, Paul, you need to play better. We need more money. <laughs> uh, I haven't said that, but I'm glad you can. You, I'll let you have that conversation, Matt. Hot, hot take, everybody. Paul needs to play better so more courses can go in. No, Paul's playing fine. He did start out. We thought, uh, what's happening? But He's, he looks like he's making good money. I think it's, it's got to be seven grand by now or something. So let's keep, let's keep hoping he's going there or hope he keeps going there. Um, so can I ask before we let you go, I know you're a busy man. You've got other relationships and things to deal with besides Nick and Matt or Josh and Matt tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, can you just tell us, this is a question I was really curious. You're down in Mexico. Did you have some authentic Mexican food and how good was it? Oh man, we had so much authentic Mexican food. It was amazing. So, um, one of the cool things is we didn't actually stay on the ranch. Um, we stayed in La Paz. So we just kind of commuted back and forth. It was about a 20 minute drive every day. And, um, yeah, we just, they had recommendations. We ate in town. Uh, the ranch had, has like, you know, they hire local, local individuals to, do most of the work at the ranch so they provide jobs in that way so had you know authentic meals every day at the ranch and it was fantastic i would highly recommend if you're looking for a vacation spot go into la paz because it's really cool and great food and then you can play a little disc golf on a course that uh, paul paul designed i was gonna ask so it's obviously on a camp uh or related to the camp is it open to public play completely uh request do you how if somebody is down there and actually wants to take take you up on that offer? How do they do it? Yes. Great question. Um, it actually, um, Paul and Joey put it on u which was really cool. Um, Paul posted some of the story. I think that is like the only course you can see in that whole, um, uh, like peninsula area. Mm. And so there's instructions on u on how to play and we'll add it to disc golf course review and, and the other places. But, um, a lot of people were wondering, like, is it closed as a private property? It's not. It is open to the public, and the ranch is awesome, and they want to, you know, work with as many people as possible. But at the same time, it is a place that has, like, kids programming. So, you know, that makes it a little bit tricky. But basically how they've set it up is that they're just – they just want you to contact them before you come. So um, kind of reservation-based. They have somebody's cell phone on staff listed on UDISC. Uh, you just shoot them a note that, hey, you're looking to come at this time. And like I said, we've already had people from the community. You know, it was funny. We had one or two people early on, and then people just started messaging us. People were emailing the camp. People were, you <laughs> know, uh, calling my cell phone and wanting to come, which is really cool. Um, so the camp is fully open, um, you know, open to the public. They want as many people to play it as possible. They're going to have events. They're going to they're gonna do leagues. They're going to do all kinds of things to just make it accessible. And I think it's going to, you know, it, it's definitely worth it. It's, it's beginner friendly, but enough challenges that when Paul shot, when Paul played it, he did not shoot nine down. So spoiler <laughs> for the video, but um, it was, you know, it's a little tricky. Um, so, um, yeah, you will, you, everybody <laughs> enjoy. And the views are incredible. Like, it's, you know, on these mountains in the desert, there's cactus, there's all kinds of stuff. They warned us there's a bunch of rattlesnakes around. We didn't see any that week, but 
just a really cool, unique experience for disc golf. Very cool. Dustin, I thank you so much for taking your time to come on the show and talk to us about this. Uh, we're interested in where the next one is. I know. I mean, I don't, I'm assuming, I don't know if I'm special or not, but there's an invite to me to join at some point. I'd like to do that. Let's just, let's just wait until I find out where it is. Maybe Hawaii or I don't know, Bermuda, (laughs) Cancun, Mexico. No, I'm just kidding. Wherever. And we're excited to hear where it is. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. We hope to announce a couple projects soon. Uh, I think we have some really awesome ones in the works that people are going to be excited about. And, um, yeah, Matt, you're welcome. Josh, let us know when you're free. Um, we'd love to take you guys along. Awesome, Dustin. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, and uh, we look forward to talking again soon. All right, guys. Have a good night. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Dustin. Adios. Is that what you say in Mexico? <laughs> Adios. Yeah, that's one of the things you can say. Yep. <laughs> Adios, amigos. That's my two Spanish words. Um, so that was Dustin Leatherman, everybody, as we already introduced him that way. Uh, Josh, what do you think? Um, is the big picture for a foundation like this. Like they go and install a course, disc golfers are psyched. They're like, yes, everybody needs to know about disc golf, but like at a deep, deeper level in humanity, like what are they doing? What do you think they're doing investing here actually? Like I, I, maybe you know what I'm saying. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's truly, I mean, it's, a, it's exciting, right? I was being a little bit sarcastic around these kids one day. We'll look back and say, right, I remember when this guy they used to call, right, the, the goat came and put a disc golf course in here. But think what disc golf means to so many of us here, right? Um, many of us, in fact, maybe most, actually by numbers wise, I would very confidently say most of us are not elite competition players, right? But yet somehow disc golf is like a major part of our life, whether it be purely recreationally, we enjoy the time outside, whether we compete against our peers, whether we take in media, um, it means something to us. And uh, this is why I think Paul expressed he wanted to start a foundation like this, right, where he could give people that experience just like he received. Um, And so being able to kind of reciprocate that, being able to give these kids from all different life situations, right? They, every one of them has a unique story, right? As, as a human on this planet, right? Not to make it too dramatic sounding, but literally for each of them, um, disc golf may be that outlet or that opportunity for them to kind of enjoy something outdoors, athletic, find purpose. Some of them will find competition. Some of them will find friends and peers and an activity to do. And, uh, you know, that's just the start. A foundation has to start somewhere and do something. And it's really cool to see uh, one of the most, uh, you know, prominent names in our sport uh, pushing. And again, he's not the first nonprofit to do it. But we just talked about earlier in the show, talk about a time to be in the sport, right? Or enter the sport. Talk about a time for a big name to push a new foundation that can really make a difference. And whether it's five kids or thousands of kids, uh, who's to say, right, um, whether that investment is worth it or not, I would argue and say it is. It's exciting to see. For sure. I think, as you said, you know, a kid one day shoots next world champion. I think at a deep humanity level, it, for the kid who had nothing to, and I'm, I'm not setting them up as they have nothing to do, but there is that kid out there, right? And to be able to have that inspiration and to say that the world's best player came and invested here, that will stick with somebody for a long time. So sure. it'll be interesting to see. You've done some work down in Mexico. Am I incorrect? Yeah. No, I actually took my family, uh, young, young kids. We went down there and really went and served at uh, uh, an orphanage. We stayed there for almost a week with our children and it was an awesome experience. Um, and when I say experience, I don't mean like we got to experience another culture, but we got, to, we were actually encouraged by those there um, really kind of enriching our life. Um, and I think that that's exciting. I would encourage anybody who can get involved in helping others, getting to know people right at their core, uh, do that, get, get to know people, get out there, help wherever you can in your local community or not. What's, what's neat about us in this particular show, it makes sense. But one of the things that I think many of us have experienced is the common bond or community around the sport of disc golf. And that's, what's neat is, uh, Paul's choosing to kind of export that experience and invest in communities. Um, I mean, our whole show is surrounding disc golf. People in our live chat here, right? Like, uh, maybe one of them have I ever met, but there's a sense of community, 
Yeah, some of them we might be okay with kicking out right now. But, <laughs> but uh, I'll leave the names anonymous, exactly. but they're not anonymous in the chat. So I will just say I think Paul is going to be affected by this. And if he hasn't already, I mean, it would have been great to talk to him tonight, but I imagine that he's being affected. He also said, like, in his documentary that got released right before going down there, more or less, like, he wants to also reconnect with his roots a little bit. And that's part of where his heritage comes from. Uh, so I think he's, it'll be interesting to see how this progresses for him as well, moving outside of Mexico and everywhere else. Um, but really, guys, we have our headline guest lined up in the virtual green room. A lot of people have been chanting, uh, Ella, Ella, Ella. We have her in the green room, but we're ready to pull her in here to the live show. So let's go ahead and do that. Ella Hansen, everybody. Welcome to the show, Ella. And are you still in California? Yep. Yeah, I'm still in California, getting getting ready for Masters Cup. Okay. Can we ask generally, where's your home state? Uh, I live in Oregon technically right now, but I'm actually moving down to the Bay Area in June, right before Worlds. Okay. Awesome. So let me, let me get this started. We're really excited for you and we want to find out a lot about your game and what your goals are here, but player rating, everyone has different thoughts about player ratings, but here at the Nick and Matt show, by the way, you're, you're talking to my brother, Josh, who's a guest fill in tonight. So that's why he's not Nick. That's Josh. Okay, uh, okay. A, yeah, you you <laughs> wouldn't know Josh? Nick, but I'm a bald version of Nick Carl. So anyway, we'll keep going. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, but Player rating and event ratings and round ratings are a way for people to compare performances to other performances. And I just want to say you had a 973 event rating and get this. Are you ready? I don't know if you, you know this stat because we, we work with Stat Mando, an awesome stat company out there for disc golf. And it, your, rate, your event rating was the best rating ever for an FPO player's first career major ever. That beat out Paige Pierce and Katrina Allen. Your 978 was the best major performance ever for an FPO player in their first major. So how did your event feel? Tell us. Like, that was obviously really good. So tell us how you felt about it. Yeah, it felt good. I know first day we kind of started with the hardest course, in my opinion. So my goal was to shoot even there, and that put me in a good place for the next day. Um, Shady Oaks was a co course I was more comfortable with, and... Um, I just managed to put together a pretty good round, had one mistake there. Um, and then yesterday just also managed to put together a pretty good round. I did struggle a little more putting yesterday. Um, I, you know, I managed to keep it pretty clean except for that one bogey on the last hole, but, um, I was like inside the circle on the first few holes and just couldn't quite capitalize on those putts. Um, a little nervous, little, just wasn't really using my legs, but once I kind of remembered that and was like okay use your legs and then I was I was back at it pretty pretty comfortably so yeah I think I haven't really had you know that feeling where I've really put together like a solid round and I guess I didn't necessarily feel like I played a miraculous round in my opinion but I felt like I you know was very solid and I've been focusing on just trying to minimize those mistakes and I, I felt like I definitely did that over the course of the weekend. Yeah now Ella you've had a fair amount of really high level success, right? In the sport of ultimate. Um, yeah. I think, it, you know, all these disc golfers who are quite aware of ultimate, but at the same time, some of us are a little bit more ignorant and we're seeing all <laughs> these stats about, wow, two time world champ, right? Like your, your skills <laughs> and your forehand, um, you know, so all of these things are amazing. And now we're seeing them translate into the sport of disc golf. But um, you're obviously fairly young as far as disc golf competition goes. Um, but mm -hmm. how would like, are, how exciting is it compared to your experiences in winning worlds? And I don't mean like is third place better than worlds, but like, how is the competition transitioning like for you? Like, is this fulfilling? Is this exciting coming out there, you know, finishing in third, maybe second, right. Even uh, fighting for a win. Um, mm -hmm. how excited do you get on the disc golf course? Very excited. I mean, yeah, like most ultimate players probably feel about disc golf or felt before the pandemic or something kind of was a little skeptical and kind of got dragged in a little bit and you know initially and then really started to enjoy it once I actually was doing it on my own um so <clears throat> I do you know I've really enjoyed myself out there obviously I would say it's a little more stressful personally you know in an ultimate you can rely on your teammates and you know you want to make sure everyone's doing well and you can kind of you know push your nervous energy outwards on, on, you know, supporting your teammates and whatnot. 
And it's a little harder to manage that nervous energy in disc golf, um, especially, you know, playing at my first major. And that's all a new experience for me. So I've been that's something I've definitely been working on and has been challenging. But I do feel like I have really, really been enjoying disc golf, been enjoying the people I've met um, and just, yeah, feeling successful. That's that's pretty awesome. I think that the disc golf has a bigger culture of like fandom kind of in than ultimate. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that play ultimate, but it's less people kind of look up to players less in, in ultimate, I feel like. So that's been a new experience for me too, is feeling like I have fans, which is, which is really cool. Yeah. There's a little bit of a disc golf celebrity culture. Obviously it's within our own community, but very much so. In fact, I was going to ask, right. So some players will work, you know, five, 10 years grinding to kind of work their, their way up. And by the time they actually play on a card with some of these top pros, they actually have nerves because they're playing with, <laughs> right, the, the people they've looked up to. Um, what was that experience for you? In other words, like how how familiar are you with all the names and the top pros? And how does it feel to actually now becoming one of them? Yeah, I'm, I would say I'm pretty familiar. Obviously, it's been a shorter journey than some other people's, um, but I've, I've been on the other side of the camera, so I've filmed at USDGC and the Women's National Championship last year. So I definitely got, you know, to kind of be face to face with those folks. And when I started getting into the sport, I started watching, you know, a lot of YouTube videos, FPO and MPO of just rounds. So I can kind of see how people play, see what people do and understand what was important for competing at that level. So it, it definitely was, you know, a little exciting to meet some of those top players and play with them. And, you know, I had a really good time last week playing uh, a practice round with Simon and Eagle. That was that was really awesome for me just to meet them in general and, and hang out with them. So hopefully there will be more of that. And, yeah, it's been really fun to, you know, meet these people and realize that they're just normal people, but also cool people and really good at disc golf. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that practice round. Um because Simon was just on earlier tonight and we said, what should we ask mm -hmm. her about? And he's like, man, did you watch my vlog? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so we were talking through it. Um, so Paige Pierce, we had on last week mentioned that you throw really far. Now, my understanding, and I've tried throwing an ultimate Frisbee and because mm -hmm. I do so much disc golf and I'm sure it's reverse for you or it was, um, there's definitely an understanding of flight, but you have to change up your technique and your angles. And how did you translate to distance so quickly? Or was there a steep learning curve? I think the initial learning curve of figuring out just how to make a disc golf disc fly the way it's supposed to was the most like intriguing and challenging part for me about disc golf. I mean, I got kind of forced into playing my first round with like a real disc golf disc. Like I would mess around and we had a, you know, when I was in college at University of Oregon, we had an 18 hole course, like object course across our campus. And so I would play, you know, sometimes on the weekends with friends and we would always play with ultra stars. So I kind of understood the like golf aspect of it in that sense. Um, but the first time I really got to throw a, a disc golf disc, even though it was just a putter, I was just, you know, straight up in the air left every time, basically <laughs> throwing a, a ready backhand because no, straight up nose up and couldn't really figure out the angles. Um, and so that was what really intrigued me because I was like, when I first actually got to throw a good throw with one of those, I figured out how to throw it. I threw it like way further than I could throw an ultra star. And that just like cooked me immediately. Um, and so then I kind of gathered up some discs from there and started playing. And I think that, yeah, for a while it was like hard, you know, if I started to play a little bit of pickup ultimate, or a league or whatever, I kind of would mess up my disc golf form and my ultimate form would be messed up. <laughs> um, but I think once I got a, a chance to, once I understood or kind of taught my body and brain well enough to learn that, that there are two different forms for throwing a disc, I super, I feel super comfortable. Like today I was tossing around an ultimate disc and like totally fine with it, but it definitely took that time to kind of learn that there are separate forms instead of, you know, morphing my ultimate throwing form to the disc golf form um, and, and vice versa. But I do feel like obviously those ultimate skills and that that form based thing has helped me with the distance and just throwing in general for a disc golf. Yeah. And can I ask, um, first of all, how far could you throw an ultra star? Like, 
just out of curiosity, if you were throwing your furthest, I think you had some nicknames out there, something like Popeye <laughs> or One Throwella or something. I don't know. Yeah. How far could you throw an a- ultra star? <laughs> <laughs> there was a very colorful uh, Australian commentator, commentator who called me Popeye Forearms. Oh boy. Um, but I think with uh, with a still wind, probably like you know seventy five, eight, probably eighty yards or so, which is like what you know two hundred and forty feet, okay. and that's like you know the, the best the furthest I've probably seen an ultra star thrown without wind is like maybe ninety yards so you can't really get them to go that far honestly um so that that's probably my max distance with an ultimate disc for sure well you're laughing because you're comparing it to disc golf but the reality is i mean anybody else try throwing an ultra star that far (laughs) it's really tough um and then finally uh, and i'll i'm sure josh has some good questions here is um what disc are you throwing did you try out any i'm i know you're sponsored by disc mania now we might talk about that but like Mm -hmm. other companies i'm thinking like Discraft, for instance, they have this disc called the Comet. Uh, you have Innova with, um, I'm thinking like the Zephyr or whatever. There's the Condor. There's all these like discs that are similar to maybe like a lid, like an ultimate d- Frisbee. Did you try out mm-hmm. anything specifically before you came to Discmania? Yeah, I, I did try out the Comet because Andrew Fish is one of like the, well, he's probably the best ultimate to disc golf convert. And I know he likes to throw that disc a lot. And so that was one of the first ones I, I put in my bag that I felt pretty comfortable with, um, with the angles. I think that, you know, as similar as you can get a disc golf disc to be like, I think like maybe like a Sonic is kind of mm. similar in terms of, you know, that kind of a catch disc where you can put it nose up and it'll just kind of glide. But most other disc golf discs, if you put them nose up, even if they're flippy or kind of like Comet-esque or whatever, it, it they won't really fly right, I guess. <laughs> um, it's it's a lot about the nose angle. I think that's the most challenging for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, right now, I think for that spot for me with this Mania, I'm throwing a D-Line MD, um, which I'm super comfortable with, just you know throwing it on a hyzer flip and letting it fa- fade out to going straight and maybe finish right a little bit. Um, but yeah, I definitely kind of try to start more understable. And I know people are, you know, say just start with putters or mids or whatever, but I really wanted to throw the drivers cause I wanted to throw it as far as I could. <laughs> That's really what hooked me. I think. Well, a lot of people say that, but you've actually proven the ability to do it. So I say <laughs> go for it. Um, so, uh, I looked a little bit right at your PDGA bio, meaning your, your event history, right? So we can kind of see you started what last fall worked your way a little bit through amateur and then pro. And then we've seen your name start to show up on some leaderboards and then finishing third at a major event. So how are you mentally handling this early career success, right? So like, so where do you go from here? besides the obvious of trying to win every event, right? But I mean, that that's part of it. Like, where are you at mentally? Um, do you feel like you're performing at the top of the game or do you feel like you've got a lot of room to grow? I feel like I have a lot of room to grow. Like, like I said, I felt like my round yesterday, it felt solid, but it didn't necessarily feel like my best. And, you know, I had probably four or five inside the circle putts yesterday that I just didn't make. Um, and so that's like the main thing for me that I've been working on and, you know, continuing to improve is my putting. And I think that's probably the hardest aspect for me um, is just, you know, putting is a totally different thing from ultimate. Um, and so that's, that's the newest part for me that's that I've been working on, but I do feel like I really can um, compete at the highest level. And, you know, like when I was filming last year at USDGC, I, went and played the course. Cause I was like, those, like those holes look like the ones I play at my home courses kind of, you know, and I, I think I could figure out how to throw them and I played and I didn't really keep that good score. And I played actually the day after. And so it was just like a rain pit. Basically <laughs> there was rivers right. all over the fairway. If you remember, yes. it was a little rainy that last just day. A little. Um, but, uh, I, I felt like I, you know, from what I had seen and for what what my throws were, I felt like if I, you know, upped the consistency a little bit, I definitely felt like I could compete at those tournaments. Um, And so that's kind of what I've been doing is figuring out if I can and it seems like I can, which is awesome. And I'm, you know, my plan is just to keep pushing, keep competing and get getting moving up those leaderboards for sure. All right. So 
I have a kind of fun question and then one that might feel a little bit more like, ooh, serious. But um, first of all, I guess yes or no. Have you thrown the tilt, the Discmania tilt yet? Hmm. I have not. All I'm right. very excited. I'm hoping <laughs> to throw it soon, though. <laughs> Uh, I was lucky enough to throw one and it is actually insane. And Simon has a whole vlog. If you haven't watched it where he throws it, it's just insane. But (laughs) the second question is tell us about what led to the, the feelings and the missed putt on hole 18 round three at the major. I know we don't love to go back to those moments, but just out of curiosity, did you know what was on the line and then what was going through your head and what led to that missed putt? Do you think? Yeah, I, I did know it was on the line. I, I was avoiding the scores. Um, I, I kind of realized, you know, after first couple rounds of, or first couple tournaments of, you know, checking the scores, it doesn't really work that well for me. Um, so I, I was not checking the scores, but I did see like the, you know, big leaderboard thing that they hold around the lead card. I kind of got a glance of it. Um, and I was a little surprised to see that they weren't far ahead of me. Um, but I was a little happy about that. And then I saw that Haley bogeyed, um, 17 while we were waiting on 18. So I did get a little nervous there. Um, and I knew kind of what was on the line and yeah, I definitely was nervous. Definitely. Um, you know, part of my putting has been to not do too much, you know, warm up pump fakes and, you know, psyching myself out. Um, and I think that that probably would have been a good good opportunity to realize I was a little too nervous and just step back and maybe reset. Um, and perhaps in the future, that'll be something that I do. Um, and like I said yesterday, I I did struggle with using my legs and just kind of felt a little off on the putting, putting green in general. Um, but it was definitely disappointing to miss that. Um, but I'm also happy to take third place and at my first major. Um, but I know that that's something, you know, I will improve on. And believe it or not, I was pretty happy with my putting in general, just because, you know, I have missed many a shorter putt than that before. And, you know, that was probably <laughs> my <all> first, <laughs> yeah, my first good round, I would say, uh, with cameras on me for, um, that I've played so far. And so, you know, the past, past two rounds I've played, on camera have been kind of bad, I guess. So it's, it's good to feel that I can do that and not just be a player who can play well while not being scrutinized or filmed. And then when I'm under the, under the camera, I I play like crap or something. So I know it's a good, you know, obviously the nerves got to me there, but you know, there's, there's always room for improvement. I've been working on my mental game um, with a, a mental toughness coach and she's been really, really helpful for me. And, I probably would have missed like four or five more putts that were that short yesterday if I didn't have her. So (laughs) moving up. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I mean, those are the types of things I think that the best pros are doing. So um, I think people, Ella, are really impressed. They're really excited. You acknowledge a little bit more of a, this is the word I used, but the celebrity culture and people are like, oh, somebody new and somebody really good who think they have or, or the fans think there's a lot of potential. Um, and so that's exciting for us. Hopefully it's exciting for you. Um, so where are our fans going to get to see you out on the tour? And that is a question. Are you actually going to tour? There's been some news about some events you may visit, but um, what does this look like for you? Are you still in the process of figuring it out? Yeah. Um, you know, my plan kind of has been to play all of these West coast events. I'm playing master's cup, um, and then Portland open and that, uh, resistance disc open up in Portland as well. Um, and then worlds, um, that kind of is the end of the West coast events. So I'm going to be taking a break, um, for some of the summer. Uh, and then I'll be playing a few East coast events in, uh, like the end of August or um, beginning of September, definitely playing um, Green Mountain Championships and Maple Hill. So that will be super fun. And then I guess I qualified for the Women's National Championship. So I will probably be playing there. So that would be be pretty sweet. Um, yeah, right now I have, you know, this year has been kind of a test for me, I guess. You know, my plan was to sign up for these tournaments and see if I can hang and see if it's something worth kind of investing more of my life in. Um, and then 
it seems so far to me like it is. Um, yeah. And so we'll see how that goes. But I definitely would be interested in touring, you know, mostly full time. So that's definitely on my horizon, but probably not for this year, although I may hit a couple more events um, that aren't already on my schedule. Okay, that just you you brought something to mind here. First of all, we're recording out of Leicester, Massachusetts, where Maple Hill is located. That's where the show nice. broadcasts from. So we'll be excited to find you out here. I'm sure we'll meet you out there. And I am a fan. Nick and Matt are going <laughs> to be fans. We'll come out there in the fandom of disc golf. Um, and you said something that was kind of interesting, how much you want to invest in this portion of whether it's your life or disc golf or whatever, like how is this working out? Can I ask um, how much was invested in Ultimate? And I know you've done a lot with that, but so was it a significant amount to where it's like, if you didn't do disc golf and you chose not to do ultimate, you would have a major void. Is that what would happen? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that that's a good way to put it. I think I, you know, I played ultimate for 12 years and I played at the top level for most of that. You know, obviously part of that, I was like in, in grade school and whatnot. So mm-hmm. not necessarily my whole life, but in college and, you know, since college, it's been a pretty big part of my life. And it's a little different with Ultimate because you pay for the season and you don't really get any sort of kickbacks. You pay for practice space, you pay for flights to tournaments, you pay for tournament fees, you pay for food, etc. And like, you don't have a contract or something that might help out with some of that or all of that or however your contract might be. Um, so mm. it's much more of an investment that way. Um, and Time-wise, it's also a pretty big investment with practicing and and everything. Mm. So, you know, I wanted to kind of, you know, I I wasn't really ready, especially being so new on the scene and, you know, fresh out of college. Not really that fresh, but a couple years out of college, I I wasn't quite in the financial position to be like, okay, I have this much in savings and I'm going to put it all in a van and go on tour and send it, you know. Um, and, and there's some other, obviously things in my life that are holding me back from that a little bit. Um, at least just taking that leap without really knowing that much about the sport. So at this point, you know, it's, it's kind of becoming time to reassess and realize that yes, I can be successful at this level and I'm really enjoying it. And I want to keep competing at this level and, you know, starting to figure out what kind of, what, what I need to do in order to be happy with that. And also, happy with the other parts of my life as well. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to meet uh, Nate Sexton at all, but he's his his origins are ultimate. He's been mm-hmm. in disc golf for many years now and obviously very successful, but he just recently talked about, he's like, yeah, I used to play ultimate and I would pay, right? And of course he loved it and he was also successful. He's like, but then I found this sport where I could throw discs and they were paying me. <laughs> right. And so mm-hmm. it, it is an interesting um, dichotomy and obviously both sports are great and amazing and right. They've got uh, lots, lots of good going for them, but that is an interesting difference for you to consider as you look at what the future may hold. Um, w- can I ask related to this, are you getting advice from other pros who have been in the scene um, for some time in making this decision. Cause some people know the ups and downs of tour life, the awesome parts or the drag or the fact, can you really, is it about the pay? Is it about the experience? Is it a little of both? Um, is there anybody mm-hmm. in particular that uh, you're seeking advice from? Yeah, I've, you know, spent a lot of time with Dustin Keegan and Zoe Andike, and they have been really, really helpful for me in terms of, you know, figuring out, sponsorships and pursuing those things and figuring out kind of what is reasonable. They're both not on tour full time right now um, this year, but they have been in the past. And so they're really good resources for me in terms of understanding, yeah, kind of the sacrifices you have to make and what's valuable and sort of um, in, in that lifestyle and how to kind of hold a balance. Um, yeah. And, and I've been starting to meet more and more touring pros and hanging out with them, which has been really cool. And I know that there are a few others that I feel like I could definitely ask, you know, for their perspective and their advice if I need to. So I probably will be, you know, in the, in the upcoming weeks and months for sure. Man, uh, I've been playing disc golf for 14 years, <laughs> thrown a Frisbee before that, and you're still out driving me. I, I'm getting a little better. And if Nick's in the chat, he needs to come out and hang out a little bit. But you're having tremendous <laughs> success. We keep talking about that um, because it's so true. And I think 
it'd be very interesting. We're asking the questions we can to figure it out, but just to be inside your head, it just seems like such a, a fast turnaround for you. Uh, can I ask this? I think I saw it in an interview you had somewhere. It, Ultimate Disc Golf is on the back burner. Is it for the rest of this season? And if so, is there a team out there that's going to miss you? Um, yeah, I've spent most of the past five years. I, I skipped a season uh, playing with Portland Schwa, my club team, um, based out of Portland, Oregon. And it, yeah, kind of a bummer timing wise with, with COVID and everything. Cause in the fall of 2019, we actually took third place at, uh, us national championships for ultimate, um, which was our best finish by far of all time, which was really exciting for all of us on the team. Um, so definitely a little bit of a bummer, but yeah, my plan, I think my plan, what I've been saying to people is that, you know, I'm trying out disc golf and I'm going to say, you know, see if I can be successful at it and see if I can, you know, continue to enjoy it. If, and I, and if I do do that, I'll probably keep playing and, you know, I will miss ultimate, but right now I'm, you know, having a lot of success in disc golf and I am really enjoying it and I'm really enjoying the people as well. And I think, you know, as much as I will miss being at every ultimate practice and every ultimate tournament, I, I would love to go hang out at, at a few, um, and I'm not, you know, ditching the ultimate scene forever, but I think for now, considering how successful I can be, I am and how much I've been in really having a great time playing, I'm I'm sticking with this golf for the foreseeable future. Do you think that and we're in the disc golf world, so again, I have a slight history here. I don't remember a time where we were really seeing ultimate players come in until it might have been part of the pandemic and prior to that, just a little bit with Brody and others. You said Andrew Fish, uh, you, I, and we see other FPO players, I think, coming in even recently, maybe not performing as high of a level. But like to us, it's, it's again, the word new is probably not the right word, but we're seeing it more. Uh, do you think that there's going to be more ultimate players who start seeing your success, Brody's success, others' success and going, hmm? Maybe we, maybe we should move over here and make uh, Ultimate a hobby. Do you think that might happen? Yeah, I think that, you know, like I said, it kind of takes that bit of investment because, uh, you know, I would say that before I started playing disc golf, pretty much all of my friends and friend group and almost everyone I knew was, was Ultimate based. Um, and so it can be a little bit intimidating, especially, you know, kind of making that change or telling people, Oh, I'm going to go play disc golf. I'm, I'm not going to play ultimate. Cause you know, I know I've <laughs> feel kind of bad for some of, you know, my friends and teammates and, you know, I feel bad for not being able to spend as much time with them or whatever. But I think that definitely people have seen, you know, the success I think. And yeah, there's a couple other FPOs, um, shouting out Alyssa Weatherford and Leah Sinaginia right now, who've been playing these tour events and, doing pretty well for themselves as well, um, who are both uh, people I've played against in Ultimate. Um, so I think that, you know, and, and on the MPO side, there are a lot more, obviously, uh, a lot of guys who have started playing disc golf. But I do see that, you know, there are a lot of them who now that Ultimate started starting to tr kind of come back for the summer have been kind of going back to, to Ultimate. And I think that for some people who might be like retired from ultimate or, or feeling like the toll on their body. It's more enticing to play disc golf, but I don't really know. I haven't, I haven't seen, I've, I've talked with a few folks who, who do feel kind of the pull towards disc golf um, over ultimate, but I don't know if there will be a whole lot uh, at the competitive level who would take it over, over uh, ultimate. But I do think that like, you know, once you get a little older, if you have a family and whatnot, it does give you a little bit more flexibility in terms of, you know, choosing what tournaments you play, choosing when you practice and whatnot, and kind of can give you a little more flexibility that, you know, playing on a high level ultimate team doesn't quite. Yeah. And Josh, I'll pass it over to you. But if you all of a sudden, Josh, like over the last six months started performing super high level at anything, let's just say it was ultimate or whatever, like speed eating a hundred hot dogs, oh like. Would you give up? You're like, you, you enjoy running a lot. 
like, man, I should just get into speed eating. It's going to really plummet my race times. But yeah, right. Well, it's interesting. as I hear, Yeah. So not to take it there you uh, go. Too, too far away from that. But Ella, right. There are there obviously is a connection. I call it like a cousin sport of like the flying disc. Right. But the, you accomplish different things. Like you said, the running around and the excitement in, in the team camaraderie. Really, in some ways, you can't compare that to a slow mental game by yourself against the course. So not everybody's looking for one or the other, but it is interesting. Um, yeah. If you're looking to see where you can be successful and you enjoy, that's what fuels you, right? Where can I find success? Then yeah. Which one are you better at? Right. And it is an interesting point for you to kind of inflect on, um, and for fans to watch, right. As we see people enter. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of those other names, like Leah, I think finished 17th this weekend at a major mm -hmm. and Alyssa 34th. Those are great performances. There were 62 women in the field. Um, and there's probably even many other names. So that's exciting. Um, so this has been reported on a little bit, but a lot of people are asking just curious because, um, so, you know, you're wearing a disc mania shirt, team disc mania. How'd that come about? Did somebody introduce you? Um, because sponsorship is a little bit unique in the sport of disc golf as well. So like, you know, entering, entering this realm, was that even something you were aware of? Did it come to you? Did they seek you out? Like, how did that, how did that relationship, uh, with disc mania play out? Yeah. So I kind of started thinking about sponsorships, you know, in December, I guess, when I started to see more and more pros who were, you know, changing sponsors or re-signing or whatever, um, and so I started to think like, oh, like, you know, looking at my rating, because I had just started playing tournaments in, I guess, September. Um, and I was like, well, I, I feel like I could be better than this. And this is what my rating already is. So I feel like, you know, might as well think about it, considering that I was like at that time, you know, sort of planning to play these these West Coast tournaments. Um, so I just mean I actually had an open call for uh, female I guess for women to reach out to be sponsored. Um, and I think they had, I heard 170 applicants. Mm. Um, and so myself and one other person got selected and, you know, I, I was very lucky that, you know, I had the relationships I do with Zoe and Dustin, Dustin, who is sponsored by Dismania and Zoe, who just is in the sport. I mean, she's sponsored by infinite as well, <laughs> yep. but she also just knows people. Um, so I, I felt very lucky to have them kind of advocating for me because yeah, like, you know, I had a few good tournaments, good rounds under my belt, but nobody really knew who I was. And so having somebody who, who trusted and believed in me and was able to advocate for me was awesome. And, um, so I ended up, uh, hearing back from Dismania and signing with them in March. So that's kind of how that all happened. And, um, yeah. So sponsorships, are a huge talk as of the last few years with Paul Macbeth getting 10 million, a mil, a million dollars a year guaranteed. Um, there's always rumors and who knows what about what these other players are getting. Eventually we think that will become more public. Um, it sounds to me like, and if you want to elaborate on it, we're not, we're not fully asking you what you're getting, but at the very least you're not paying to play disc golf, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I sort of have been paying a little okay, bit. Okay. Um, I think, you know, this mania wanted to, to give me some, some love, but also, you know, it was kind of in March and they probably had already extended most of their sponsorship budget for the year. Okay. Um, considering that most people's contracts, you know, happen in, in December and January. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of, you know, I actually had an offer from a different company that would pay for my entry fees and stuff. And this mania isn't paying for my entry fees. Um, but they did offer a, a nicer bonus structure. And so I kind of took a bet on myself mm. that, you know, mm. if I, if I get a good finish in at a couple tournaments that basically covers up, covers up for that. Um, and I felt more comfortable with the Dismania discs than with the other manufacturer. So I, yeah, I bet on myself and it's been working out and hopefully it will keep working <laughs> out. It. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. So this last event, and again, you don't have to elaborate on what the bonus structure is. Um, I've seen some of them, but to finish third at a major and to get your payout generally, you, that's cool for you. I think this year, at the end of this year, I hope you start reevaluating and negotiating. And I think if you continue yeah. out, 
with the performances you're having. I mean, we had Paige Pierce on last week saying, know your value. Like you got to know your value. So like, that's really cool. I can't believe you're coming into the sport at a time like this. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. So in getting ready to wrap this up, there's another question that keeps getting asked on the chat board tonight. And it, you mentioned graduating from college. What, I, what is your degree in, if you don't mind sharing? Uh, I double majored in product design and digital arts. Very cool. Uh, like graphic design stuff or what? Product design is more like physical design, um, which was something I really enjoyed and also have, it's kind of, it's a very specified um, field, I guess. So like you kind of have to be really into it full time, all time in order to be successful with it. So I've kind of focused more on the digital art side. I, I've been doing some video work. You might see me out there filming some stuff. Um, and then, yeah, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I've, I've kind of enjoyed, you know, after college, the life of having a few different jobs everywhere. Um, and that's been worked well for me. So that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. Yeah. And so I relate to you in some of my interest. I love, and I didn't do anything for college for this, but I've always been into digital arts. I do multimedia. I do the show. We do video production and I've recently, have you ever messed around with a 3d printer doing it at 3d? Gra yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So that's something I recently got into. What's some of the things you like to design? Oh man. Well, part of like through, through school and whatnot, I've, you know, I've made a fully functioning like ballpoint pen that's 3d <laughs> printed, which is pretty sick. Yeah. Um, visually there's, there's a way to sort of print out like uh, topographical maps. So I've yes. printed out a couple, a couple like mountains and stuff. Um, which is pretty sweet. Yeah. 3d printers are just super fun to mess around with. Like I wish that I had my own, but back in college, I definitely did a lot, you know, when we had free access yeah. to 3d printers, it's, it's pretty sweet. So let me, <laughs> when you come out to maple, first of all, I'd love the STL file for the ballpoint pen. If you're not selling it, if you're just giving it away, Okay. <laughs> but two, you mentioned the topographical. Now, listen, anybody that's listening to the show right now, you cannot steal this idea. It's between me and Ella. I did this like drone flight around Maple Hill. Okay. And then I used this like imaging software to like 3d render my drone flight. It's really cool. And then I brought it into like a 3d modeling software and I got to clean it up quite a bit, but man, if you could reproduce like iconic disc golf courses, 3d printed and make a really cool case display, like it would be hot fire selling. So we'll have to talk. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk. That's a great idea. <laughs> See, we're geeking out here. Okay. 3d design and <laughs> graphics. I have to, I'd learn a lot from you, Josh. Do you have anything else that you're thinking that we should get to Ella with? I'm just nodding and smiling. I'm like, yeah, that sounds really cool. I'll, I'll be the one to buy it. <laughs> no, I love that. I mean, Ella, I'd like not so many more questions, although we could probably chat casually for a long time. What I would say is I don't think you have you had anything to prove to anybody or, or anything beyond just coming on and representing yourself. But I think you want a lot of people over again, yeah. not, not that you were trying to do that, but just so you know, I think people, people are excited uh, to see new faces, to see people who are excited about the sport. Uh, I have said this over and over again in any media production I'm in people just uh, fans, even though some people like to critique and be cynical and there's lots of debate and drama, which can be fun in its own right. At the end of the day, people want to see people performing at their best, right? Competition is the most exciting when the top performers are playing at their best. Um, and to have somebody like yourself pushing into those ranks, right? Uh, you still have, uh, you know, many years ahead if you choose to do that, but just, uh, people are excited. So, um, you know, thank you for, uh, joining the sport. Um, and we're, we're excited uh, to have you part of that conversation. Thanks. Yeah. You know, part of why I started playing disc golf is I saw, you know, I know that there are some incredible competitors in FPO, but I also know that the depth of the field is not that deep. So, I kind of wanted to push that boundary a little bit too. And I hope that I can show other people, other women, especially that, you know, it's, it's out there. There's a potential for you to, to be that person too, and to, you know, join the competition. So I'm really stoked about that. <laughs> for sure. And let me ask this before we let to let you sign off is how many disc or let me go back to ultimate. How many ultimate podcasts have you ever been on in all the years? Are there ultimate podcasts? Mm -hmm. There's a few, but probably like, two or three. <laughs> okay. So now that you've entered the disc golf world, I know you've already been on one, our friends over at Smashbox. Um, have you been on any others or people reaching out to you besides us? 
Yeah, I, I have a couple more lined up actually for this week. I've done I've done a few, but yeah, it seems to be now's the time, I guess, that people want to want to have ver- me on, at the very hopefully... end. At the very end, we'll have you complete a survey on who is the best. But we'll, we'll <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And I can't. I'm not going to do it justice the way Nick does, but he always says, "Shameless plug." Where where can the people find you, Nick? I I, I did it horrible, but where can the people <laughs> find you on social media and how can they support you? That is something in disc golf right now still, seeing as you're not getting paid fully to disc golf. How can they support you right now? I mean, you probably have Venmo or something, but is there a disc or any other way for them to support you? Yeah. Um, well, shout out to my sponsors, Upper Park, uh, OTB, Dismania, obviously, um, and VC Disc Golf. Uh, let's see. You can help support me by buying an Upper Park bag and using my code ELLA10. They're awesome. I bought it before I was even close to being sponsored by them. So it's a great bag. Um, OTB, hopefully I think in the next couple of days slash maybe a week or two, we'll be having some of my uh, custom stamp discs up on their website and buying those will definitely help me. Um, you can Venmo me if you really want to. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, you give can, out uh, your Venmo. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, and uh, you can follow me on Instagram at one throw Ella. Um, that's probably, that's where I, you know, stay up to date for all the disc golf stuff. So that's, that's how you can help support me. Um, yeah. Say hi at tournaments. If you want to, I, I like meeting new people and signing things. That's a new experience for me that yeah, I've really that enjoyed. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Is there anything we missed that you would like to shout out to anybody besides sponsorships or you think we covered most everything? I think you covered most everything. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, we look forward to seeing your performance. Um, unfortunately, and I don't know if you heard this, there's not going to be any live coverage at Santa Cruz, the Masters yeah, Cup. So I saw that. That's that's too bad. It's the way it is right now with cell service and whatnot. But um, good luck out there. People will be following you on the leaderboards. Uh, keep up the good work and um, look forward to seeing your future success, Ella. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Have a great evening. You too. All right, everybody. That was Ella Hansen technically now of disc mania and she's out there surprising those who maybe knew her aren't surprised but like in the disc golf world we're like who's this like almost second place just that missed putt right um josh did anything stand out to you um about this interview just a general like what did you think oh well there were there are actually a lot of things <laughs> um i i like that she bet on herself yeah <laughs> I mean, first of all, there's some confidence there, but not only confidence, there's also some awareness that like, I want something right to fuel myself and push. Um, yeah, and that's kinda, right. About the bonus structure. Yeah. To come out and say, yeah, you know, somebody else uh, would have paid for my entries, which is, you know, some, some version of cash up front. But on the flip side, I would much rather be compensated for performance, um, which has more of an upside. And as she said, it's paying off so far. <laughs> um, and again, I, I clearly don't think it's only about the pay, but I think uh, it's just really interesting. She mentioned something I've talked with you about before, and she recognized it. And I think this is cool because, like, again, I hope other people do this. She saw the depth of field in FPO is not as deep as it should be, both for just the fact of like the sport has so much to offer. There should be more women playing the sport. So just that in and of its own right. But then also from a competitive standpoint, she's like, wait a minute, if the field's not that deep and I come out and perform well, right, then uh, relatively speaking, um, I can show up on the top of the leaderboard. And, you know, Matt, I have also had this opinion and I've shared it in other, uh, you know, shows that we've been on that disc golf in general, and it's fun. I'm part of the media. I enjoy it, but we do also tend to overreact quickly, right? The pendulum swings so fast. I think there's a ton of potential from what we've seen with Ella. So I'm, I'm on board and I'm excited. However, it's really early, right? So like, let's see. Um, however, she seemed to say all the right things. She recognized the mental game. Matt, she has a mental coach. She's like brand she new seems, to our sport. She, yeah. se- she seemed to focus on the right things. Even some of her failures, the missed putts, she she talked about them the right way. She seems set. She's she seems athletically driven. mature. I don't know if that's the right thing to say. Yeah. So like, so all of those things are, mature. Right, are, are quite amazing. So um, I am not one who's inclined to say she will be the next best player 
only because it's too early. But I am inclined to say she seems to exhibit everything that could put her there. Mm. So like, I, that's exciting, right? Like, so I, um, it's exciting for the sport. Like I said, I just want to see people play well, um, whether it be Paige, Haley, Katrina, Ella, Man. Holly, Kona, you go down the list and I know I left names off. I just want to see them play well. Um, <laughs> this year. It's exciting. This yeah. year has been a standout year for FPO. In fact, besides the Simon interview, which is like, hey, how'd you do two weeks ago? And Dustin Leatherman, executive director of Paul Macbeth Foundation, how did the project go? This whole show is pretty much dedicated to FPO, which yeah. I don't know if we could have done that without struggling like two years ago. Uh, but now we're going to, we have a lot more topics lined up to close out the Ella conversation for right now. I think we should see some one throw Ella stamp discs in the near future. I would imagine for sure. Uh, some other branded apparel in disc golf. It's really important. She said, you know, fandom that is going to be her brand if she wants it to be. And there's going to be fans that will support that already right now. I think there's a demand for it right now. She's a, she's a rising star. Um, are we overreacting? <laughs> <laughs> and that's our yeah I mean, it depends in the big context right yeah i mean if you're saying she's the best player or she will be like based on what right people like, are waiting for me to ask the question tonight i yeah well, they go, were waiting go for it i'm not asking that i know i would never they say were that waiting kind of yeah you never <laughs> they were waiting um but i'll ask it with her she's too nice <laughs> ezra was very nice too but is this a fluke but the the, the reason why it doesn't work here and i'm going to elaborate on why the fluke question doesn't work here We've seen her with these average, I say average, she's averaging her performances in a very high position. Like she's doing that. The reason why it worked for Ezra is because there was so much hype throughout the end of the season and the off season. And then he comes back to his very first event and literally performs higher than we've seen him perform. That's why it deserved the question. I don't think she deserves the question. Was this a fluke? I do wonder if we're overreacting, though. Is she going to be a top five, top 10 performer? Uh, or is she going to continue to rise? I don't know. Yeah, and, and again, I don't think we're overreacting in this context. What I'm saying is let's not overreact. I think I am as impressed as I should be by what we saw. And I think that does deserve the, the conversation. It deserves the interview she got. It deserves our praise for finishing third at a major in the U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship. And by the way, showing up with some decent performances at prior events this year. So it's not overreacting in that context. All I'm really saying is like, hey, it's early, but this is awesome, right? It, it holds lots of promise. Let's see how it actually plays out, which means, yeah, to, tune your eyes, right, to the field of FPO right? Watch, see what's happening. And Matt, maybe you kind of mentioned this in passing, um, but having an FPO focused event where they were not also competing for coverage with MPO, like kind of felt compelling and it felt right. Like it felt like, okay, let's actually focus on the competition um, and not try to split ourselves, whether it be split on coverage or split on interest or split the tabs on you disc. Right. Um, and obviously there are lots of logistical reasons and why we, we do split and share the resources across most of our other events, but I thought it felt pretty cool and unique. And I'm not talking about six months, a year or 10 years. I have no idea, but is that shades of potentially the future of being able to have kind of parallel tours where they can really focus on FPO for how, what they deserve and focus on MPO, right. For what they deserve. Um, I don't know, just interesting. Um, it was great to have that live coverage and all the focus and the storylines were all FPO storylines. I thought that was neat. Yes. And the larger question, and if you're watching or you're listening, driving around your vehicle, um, the larger question is, is this where the FPO division needs to get to? Because it did feel right. It felt like all the attention should be on them when there's a tournament that's featuring them. Like, imagine if that could happen. I mean, in, in all sports, it's happening every weekend for both, you know, it, and I want to be clear, we, we don't tiptoe around this, but MPO is not technically male division. That's not what it is, but that's what it is. Um, I, I think there's something to say when we feature it so strongly, it makes it seem as if this is the men's and that's the women's, but 
a whole conversation is this where it needs to go? And I think the answer is yes. Is it ready to go there? Man, this major showed us a real explosion. Like that's, I don't, I didn't do the math. What's the percentage growth on that? It's like hundred more is like, I don't even know. It was a lot. It was a large percentage increase. So the events are starting to get overgrown. FPO are already considering saying we need to take some spots from the MPO division so we can have more like it's happening. I think it's going to take somebody. And I don't know, Todd Rainwater, the guy who owns the disc golf pro tour. If he can fund and say, yeah, let's, let's try a test year. Let's give it a go. You'd have to hire almost a whole new crew. <laughs> But all right, uh, wrapping up that topic, there is something that I want to show as we transition into the next part of our show where we are going to talk about some maybe hot topics and speculate a little bit more about disc golf. But Paige Pierce, a uh, winner of uh, Brain Freeze, this major <laughs> uh, U.S. women's, um, she reached out to the show and she said, hey, can you promote a project that I'm working on? Josh, did you happen to catch and see this other camera guy that was specifically focusing on Paige at this tournament? Did you happen to see that at all? Well, yeah, well it didn't quite look like our DGN live camera guys <laughs> roaming the course. So right. I think something's going on. Yeah, and they kind of alluded to it on the, the live coverage. They said, oh, she's got some documentary thing going on. But Paige reached out and she said, here, I've got a, a tease video, if you will, a promo video for what she's working on. Um, and I'm really excited about it, but she needs the disc golf community's help. I can tell you this, documentaries are not cheap. So here's the intro from Paige. Uh, let's check it out. Disc golf is my whole life. I don't know if... I'm Paige Pierce, and I'm a professional disc golfer. I've been throwing discs since I was four years old when my dad first started to teach me the sport. That was 25 years ago. In 2010, I became a full-time touring professional. Competing as a professional athlete, traveling all over the world is such a unique way of living and something I'm really passionate about. So I wanted to make a feature length documentary to share that experience with you. And I really need your help. Money, go in. We appreciate every single donation. And to show our appreciation, we have some awesome perks, including the most limited edition Fierce that we've ever made. This is going to be a Crystal Flex Fierce and you're gonna love it. With your donations, we will be able to cover all the costs of traveling, camera crew, editing, and all the other expenses that go into creating a project of this scale. Thank you for considering donating. And more importantly, for the opportunity to share disc golf with the world. Wow. So what's your reaction to that? I mean, the, the, the bass tones and the fierceness coming out kind of get you like a little bit, I don't know if I want to be pumped or I'm like inquisitive or draw me in. So yeah, I'm like, don't make us wait. Like what's coming. Yeah. Do you That's get, awesome. are you someone who enjoys taking in sports? Um, I don't want to call them hype videos, but documentaries and the stories to how they get to championships. Do you like that stuff? Oh yeah. And the more you get into a sport, the more you, you want that because it kind of becomes a little bit ingrained in your life and you're like, yeah, give me the goods, right? Like, yeah, get deep, get exciting in the production level as it ramps up, as we've seen from different production companies, it's compelling. Yeah. I think our sports growing that way too, by the way, we're seeing more and more of it. So this is, I don't have full insight here. But this is funded, I believe, by Paige Pierce herself. I don't know if she has sponsorships and all that coming in, but she does. And she's asking um, Nick and Matt show listeners, followers, anybody who's really interested, if we could get the word out. She said the link is not live yet. Uh, I have a text saying that, but she said follow her social media because tomorrow the announcement is like releasing from her channel. So this was an exclusive. Oh, so yeah, it's a true teaser. <laughs> yeah. It's like, all right, going to give you just enough. Tomorrow, the yeah. release. All right. Well, that's cool. Indiegogo and um, maybe some other ways, but follow her social media tomorrow. She said Tuesday, it's going live. Thank you, Paige, awesome. for reaching out here, friend of the show. I know we she was able to share some of her insights into last week's um, tournament, uh, her feelings about it going into it. And that's definitely notable and worth talking about. Um, 
I, I hesitate. Go listen over to um, Grip Locked. That's our brother show, if you will, on the Foundation Podcast Network. They did break down Paige's interview a little bit more because we had the interview. They were able to break it down. Um, so I don't think I'm going to get deep into it, but you did have a lot of notable players following our interview with Paige last week saying more or less the same things. It was, it was definitely a co- topic, and I meant to actually ask Ella, but that's okay. We didn't need to ask her that. Um, so, Josh. Let me ask this question as we get near the end of our show. At what point in a touring professional disc golfer's season, when something doesn't seem to be working, do you know it's time to change something? And let me set this up. Paul talks about off season. Practice, practice, practice. That's when I work. That's when I work. That's when I work. The season is just not playing, but it's playing what I've worked on. Kona Panis. Coming into the season says, hey, I found a new putting style. And if you've watched it, she, it's very unique to watch. It's almost, a, it's almost a throwing putting style, okay? And if it worked for her, it worked for her. We've seen some weird things in the history of disc golf. If you go way back, okay? Uh, I'm trying to think. Maybe not Ron Russell, but like go way back. You see some weird stuff. People facing away from the basket and then like turning around right before they, and throwing it. Like you see some interesting things and mental game is so huge for disc golf. But Kona would have been easily second, easily, if she hit putts. And I, it's hard to not think it's her putting style. Should she change her putting style? That's my whole question at this point in the season. All right. Well, yeah. So you you framed two questions. Yeah, the very ahead. last question you framed, the way you framed it was, should Kona change her putting style? We, I mean, you're going to think I'm being facetious, but I'm not. But I'm like, you got to ask Kona that, right? Like, should she change it or not? I don't know. Like, why did she miss those putts, right? Um, did she miss them because there's still mental challenges? Does she feel like, I'll use your, your word, does she feel like it was a fluke? Or is there actually something about that physical motion that's not as reliable, right? Or that's not as, um, you know, uh, or she's not as confident. So then the physical motion actually plays into a mental game. Um, so of course, I, I mean, literally, if, I mean, I understand we have conjecture and opinions, but we, I don't think we can say should Kona or, or not, but to use her as an example, um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting, um, for a professional, she reworked her whole putt in the off season. Right. That's my point is she, I, I think what happened without, I, we kind of asked her in an interview, if you go back and listen. She felt this confidence and was it lucky? Like, oh, I can throw this style and it goes in because I haven't been throwing it that well, putting that well. And now it's like saying, like you said, is it actually a physical characteristic of that putting style that is negative and like the confidence has worn off? Um, I feel like we would see more people doing that. Confidence is huge and she needs to do what she feels most confident with. But you have to believe at this point, after that performance, 57th on putting and it it was hard to watch. I'm sure it was hard to be her and miss those as well. Yeah, and clearly she would say that's not acceptable. And I'm sure she's thinking about where am I at with this, which by the way, creates a cycle. This is my point. Yeah. So mentally now, maybe she needs to change it to go the other way. Right. Well, so uh, yeah, so to, I'm not saying if I have the same conclusion or not, but your <laughs> your point was if she had stuck with her original putting style, in theory, Matt, she may have went through- um, Yes, through a drop in a valley, mental challenges, whatever it is, but that she would have actually went back up again, um, naturally because the progression of mental challenges, you can get better. But in, when she was down in that valley, she actually chose to change her putt. She came back up out of the mental game and, and she actually thinks what improved her game was the change of putting style. And now it's questionable. But that is a hard place to be in because where what was what was the cause of her original issues? Because by the way, she's had some putting challenges in the past, right? There were some, you know, events where you're like watching on one hole where you're seeing a three or four or five putt, and it's like it's it's tough, right? Um, I, I mean, it, here's the thing: she obviously needs to think about it. Oh, she golf, is thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Clearly, and golf is such a finicky thing. We know mental game is so much. We just heard it from Ella. We've heard it from Paige. Paige has a quote literally from this event where she like crushed the field, where she says this was the best mental 
like she's ever like felt and she needs yeah. to keep that going. So we know that's a big part of it. So, um, yeah, Kona's going to have to think about your main question, which wasn't pointed directly at Kona. No. Was, was when at what player, point does a yeah. pro think about it? Does she need to wait for the off season to rework this right. and push through? Or is it like, oh boy, this is such a big problem. Now is the time to kind of reset and like, refresh. The, the ship is going down because she threw... And I'm just putting this out there because people are saying she made some hot takes about the course before the tournament, you mm -hmm. know, like, yeah. and, but here's the thing. The course was not her problem. She actually slayed it yep. second, second, only to Paige Pierce, T to green. And by minimal margins, she slayed the field, but her putts, she, I, I'm, I'm lost because her putts are literally, it was not, that's not the course's issue. She slayed the course. So I, anyways, yeah. I, I don't know when you change it, but that was a topic. I'm just interested in other feedback on that. Yeah. I mean, it's really too hard to say. So then if you're literally asking me as Josh Graham, which my opinion means, uh, it actually, I should, should say it should mean nothing to Kona, <laughs> right? My opinion, as far as disc golf discussion goes, I think it's worth considering. I would say, yeah, like consider refreshing your putt. You can't have entirely forgotten what you used to do. Maybe try it in, in the backyard for a little bit, see where it comes out. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's foolish advice, but that's what that's what Josh would say. Yeah, and I want to say Kona is a friend of the Nick and Matt show. Um, maybe not for much longer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we don't rant on people to hate on them. We, we want to speculate because we love the sport so much and talking about it. We wish nothing but the best for Kona, Panis. Uh, as I said, incredible performance off the tee. Like, World class, Li yeah, literally second yes. to to Paige, and Paige was like a, a you know a step above, and she was right there. Which Kona is really good off the box, but I think that was even like exceptional for her throughout the whole tournament. She yeah. was only two strokes different off the box than Paige, yeah, as far as strokes the whole game tournament. off of yeah. the box. That's yes, which was like twenty above the field, exactly average. killed it. So okay, enough. <laughs> we we tried to balance out how amazing Kona was right, with right. like how yeah. to talk about that. It's but, true though, but that's why it's a story. That's why it's frustrating because somebody struggling with putting and struggling with you know T to green is somebody yeah. who just finishes middle of the pack. Somebody who's killing it to green but struggles with putting is a story. Yeah. So both. Well, yeah, never mind. I was going to say something else. I'll just leave it be. All right. uh, venue is so important to the perception of event status. We saw that going into last week, the major. Yeah. Um, that's what the talk was. It was like, hey, is this really a major? You had players. Uh, comp you had even MPO players starting to comment on it. And Brian Earhart. You had Missy Gannon, Kona, Vanessa Van Dyken, Haley King. Pierce, all these names saying it. And when I watched it, I already, we already talked about how it felt right to feature and have a whole weekend for FPO and how we would love to see more of that. But at the same time, did some, it felt off to me when I watched this tournament play out. Yep. Like I know we see tennis courts and basketball courts at some pro tour events, but in general, the logistics of it, the, the, I'm not bashing someone's quality. Okay, it it's fine, but when you hold it against the standard, and this is the interesting part of what the Disc Golf Pro Tour has done, and that's what we've watched so often, it just shows you now. It shows you what the the elite disc golf tournaments should look like. The Disc Golf Pro Tour has modeled it, and I think that's what's happened here. The players were so used to that. Yeah. Do you have any reaction to that? Yeah, well, right. So let's even just for argument's sake, and this argument might even be right. Let's say that the tournament directors and the people on the ground and the club and everybody who's part of the event, let's say they did the absolute best with what they had, okay? Because maybe they did, right? So let's actually say that. Let's actually kind of acknowledge that for the moment. I think what is becoming more and more um, important is venue matters, okay? Um, all of our big events, whatever they are, Almost all of them have a dedicated course they return to year after year after year, which builds a reputation. It lets them refine the course. It lets the players be familiar with the course. You get consistent storylines from year to year to year about the event, who performed well, who didn't. It allows you to have amenities, right? It allows you to make sure you can get the right kind of media coverage. Um, and so I think one of the big problems, quite frankly, is the fact that um, you rotate this event around. And so you get experiences like this in addition to, and we can talk about it, but like pages comments and then all the other pros who jumped on that, uh, right. To agree with, uh, is this event in and of itself being taken seriously enough? 
right? And I think bouncing it around makes that hard. That's why I brought that up. Like, I think it makes it hard to do all the things the pros expect when it's at a new place with new tournament directors every year, right? Because it's not that even the PDGA, even though we haven't heard much from them, they might say, yeah, we wish, we wish it was at that standard, but literally you move it every year. You've got a Mm -hmm. new team and new people, new courses, new designs to consider. You never get to refine that event ever. Because Matt, next year, it'll be a quote unquote new event again. Because there will be a new TD staff, new courses. Nobody's had time to, to learn the courses or refine the courses. And the Disc Golf Pro Tour, for the most part, as they're still kind of maturing, they've got a pretty well-established venue and courses. Some of them are becoming more and more well-known. Yes, they're introducing some new ones periodically. But think of all our other big events that we know. USDGC, one of the reasons I think it's so premier is the history of the course. And, of course, the players and all that. But why do the players care? Because there are storylines there. That, I mean, Innova nails it. But guess one of the reasons they can nail it, not only do their investment and experience, but they do it at the same place every year. Um, I, th- I know Pro Worlds rotates around, but, but the truth is, I think it is a challenge even for regular Pro Worlds, right, to maintain the standards we're starting to see compared to USDGC and Pro Tour events. Even Pro World in and of itself is facing those same challenges when you rotate it around. Some of the best Pro Worlds events are happening at places that have hosted Pro Worlds before. That's not an accident, right? So what Nate Heinel does out there um, in Illinois is because he's done it over and over and over again. What, what Dynamic Discs and Doug... Yurkis do in Emporia is because they've done it over and over again. So I think a major championship like U.S. Women's, uh, you know, Paige's opinions whether I, whether I like or not the way that conversation went down, the point stands. But I think it stems from rotating an event around. I think it's very hard to to maintain the level of expectations that we're all coming to expect. Yeah. Um. By the way, people in the chat are like, "Who is this guy?" I'm a They're bald, like, bald Nick Carl. <laughs> he's a natural. And Josh and I do have a show over on the Disc Golf Network called Disc Golf Pro Talk with Matt and Josh. Hmm. Um, if you like Josh's takes, you got to go check it out. Um, in getting close here, this is not near our longest, <laughs> but, but we're averaging a little above here. But just to kind of wrap it up because I, I brought up our show not purely to advertise the show but you had a take on the other show that said i wish page would have done it post event have you have you refined that at all i think that was a great take and i've actually settled on agreeing with you yeah i mean it's a hard place to be right because if page does it if, if in other words here's here's kind of my opinion on this whole thing the points she made and the ones the other pros underpinned i actually think fundamentally in principle are right so i think she's right um, I'm frustrated a little bit about the word you use, the mystery of the PDGA and their response and how this is managed, right? So like a lot of those things, I would probably jump right into that discussion and, and participate. Um, but yeah, I did make a comment and say, I wish that kind of public airing of grievances, if it needed to happen at all, would happen after the event because the risk of happening before the event is it's, it kind of sets the stage and it actually takes away a little bit of the storyline. Of course, the hard part, Matt, is if you do it after the event and you don't win, then it feels like oh, I'm complaining about I, it's an excuse for not performing. So maybe it's a no no win situation. Um, but yeah, like coming out before the event um, and kind of making that statement, uh, I just don't love the way it happened. But I've also thought about this. And when I say I don't love the way it happened, that's not all about Paige. Like, I am probably equally frustrated as she is about, like, I am just so frustrated that it even has to happen this way. It's a major for our sport, right? And so I'm frustrated with everybody involved, at least who, who that that discussion has to play out that way. I'm frustrated with that position. Arguably speaking, Paige may be right in that she's just as frustrated and maybe she feels like this is the way it has to be addressed. Um but I also wish the PDGA would like have something to say and maybe I've missed it, but have they said anything? And by the way, do they, do they have to react publicly immediately to any pro's opinion? No, they don't. But also they don't have to be silent either. This is, there's no rule about like, they're not allowed to say anything. So like use some discretion and come out and address something. And um, I will say if they choose to address it with Paige privately, I would hope Page because she did it on a public stage would come out and acknowledge acknowledge that exchange or lack thereof. 
Uh, it's just such a weird situation. That's the, I, sad, that's you the asked, saddest way to say it. You asked if they were um, done anything or if they're being silent. They don't have to say anything, but they could also not sit silently. This is my point about when I said the mis mystery of the PDGA. This was my point. You're right. They do not have to say anything. Um, and like, really, I mean that. Like, I support that. Like, they're just going to wait it out. Like, that's fine. They know it's a big media eruption. Like, they know, okay, it's going to calm down, like, page one. <laughs> but like, and they're going to take it and probably learn from it all. But the fact that they don't say anything. And, and okay, in an interview with Paige, the um, press conference. The PDGA rep there, I forget his name now. He's a new new guy working with them to do their like media. Okay. Um This is for the PDGA? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh I think Steve Hill used to do it. Yeah. And that's now right. this yeah. this guy is taking okay. his spot. And um Paige said, and I hope more or less the PDGA hears this, and he off camera says, Yes, the PDGA has heard your concerns and they are going to continue to hear your concerns. That was like his response. And I'm like, he's not wrong. Like they're hearing it. And what is he supposed to do in a press conference? He's not like the guy like to answer. Yeah. But like, it'd be nice. It would be nice if the PDGA, but you know what's going to happen? They're going to write up some formal, formal professional thing, which is fine. And they're going to do a release and it's just going to come off as very, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'm not giving the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm frustrated because I actually tend to kind of somewhat I have a lot of opinions, but yeah. I walk a little bit balanced in that. Like, I want to actually give some credit to the PDGA, even if you'd be yeah. cynical. Like, surely they're trying to do their best. Like, that's just, I feel yeah, inside. I'm like, they, sure. they must be. They care about the sport. Surely they want the best for the majors. But then I sit there and be like, but they're not quite proving it. And then I, I start like questioning myself. <laughs> and then the same with like, you know, Paige. I'm like, come on, surely she must know who to call like what, what do you mean she doesn't know who to call or what do you mean but then I'm like I don't know maybe like maybe she's actually right like this is crazy world right because it's it's a major for the sport we all care about that's why I'm actually most frustrated I could have a hundred opinions on why the PGA doesn't say this word or why Paige you know posts something like this publicly but they're almost secondary to the bigger issue of like why do we have to live with this issue um so yeah I, yeah. I hope it gets worked out um I am not confident just for an opinion that it will in the next year or two yeah. And so to our longtime listener, Daniel in the chat saying, yeah, maybe just let it be quiet. Did anybody even really hear what Paige said? And I want to reiterate Paige Pierce, the most followed disc golfer, probably in social media, especially for FPO. She's up there at least the highest, but also Missy Gannon, also very up there. Kona Panis, probably the highest FPO social media follower. I have to go look at that. Vanessa Van Dyken, Haley King, Brian Air, people heard. And so it's not necessarily that people haven't heard. So I, yeah. I, I'm going to wrap and by up the way. Topic. Well, yeah, well, I'll let you wrap it up, but yeah. it also doesn't really matter if everybody actually heard or not. I mean, I understand that's the buzz of the story, but what matters is if your top pros feel that way, eventually that creates, problems. that's a great point. Like eventually that creates problems. The PDJ needs to care because they have some of the top pros who care. Like, I mean, come on, right? Like I understand the media buzz and the hype is maybe the bigger PR concern, but at the end of the day, on, that was a great point. <laughs> yeah. On, at the end of the day, if the pros have a problem, who cares what the fans think? I mean, there is a delicate balance. And I this and this is what the Disc Golf Pro Tour is doing. And that's what Paige was contrasting. I think that's a big part of it. Yep. If right. it were me, if it were me, and I'm not, I like that's a silly <laughs> thing to say, but if I were Paige, I would have been just as forceful and clear, but I would have went straight to the PDGA and not posted it publicly. Mm. And then if the PDGA says, yeah, we don't care about that, then you have a different kind of forum to stand on. I don't know. <laughs> We're going around me. the circle. Paige said she didn't know who to contact. I think what she meant by uh, that, because I saw a PDGA, I saw somebody go, oh, I know. she has the contacts in her phone. Like it started turning this back and forth. I think she meant at this event, who is the person that's like assigned here that I'm supposed to talk to? Like, who is that? I think that's what she meant. Yeah. But moving on from that topic, because we're, we're really getting ready to wrap up here. Um, sure we are. Yeah, no, for real. <laughs> I agree. Um, the Disc Golf Network, we, we alluded to this in the Ella Hansen uh, interview. Mm -hmm. They're not streaming the Master Cup due to Verizon cell service. Yeah. So there's a couple thoughts that come to mind. One is we're still bound by cell service until that's a issue that's not in the world that's how the disc golf pro tour chooses a lot of their events based off of that do they have good cell service if we're going to make you a pro tour event they'll send somebody out there or they'll have somebody test to see what kind of signals they get that's number one master cup is not a disc golf pro tour event; it's a national tour 
Um, and so that's not really, was not their decision per se, as far as like, hey, can we do it or not? Um, they tried for a couple of months is how the report is. Go check this out of the Disc Golf Pro Tour uh, on one of their media releases. Um, they tried for a couple of months and they just weren't able to get what they needed. They brought in the people in the industry who could maybe help boosters, everything up to Josh. Apparently they'll bring in something called a cow, yeah. which is like sell on some wheels, sell on wheels. Thank you. Um, which I guess they use for events like the Super Bowl, 50,000 people in one spot, Boston Marathon. Well, yeah, it's wherever yeah, hundreds of yeah. thousands or emergency situations or whatever needs to happen. But, but can you imagine what the cost qualify. of that would be? Yeah. And we probably don't qualify. Yeah, That's right. They said that was their only answer. So, Yeah, yeah, it's just a bummer. I think it'll be, uh, we've talked about before, um, man, media coverage is what makes an event. And it's another example of a PDJ event may struggle to get as much press by the, I mean, clearly here's the thing. There's going to be tons of awesome post-produced coverage. So nobody worry. You're going to get to take it all. And it'll be amazing from all of our amazing production companies, but man, what a bummer. Uh, no live coverage, right? So if there's something crazy exciting and you're following me on you disc, right on the last round, and I'm making up the two names just because stereotypical, if Ricky and Paul are neck and neck on that last day, that's going to suck. Yeah. So let me, let me say this. Uh, first of all, the chat, someone goes, I forget who it is here. It's actually a long time listener. I think it was Todd. <laughs> they could use satellite. Uh, talk to Johnny V about that. No, you can't use satellite. You still have to find a way to get your camera's feed to the satellite truck. And then you would have to, it's a, it's a lot more than yeah. just a satellite. And then the other thing is, how do you think Joe Mess in central coast? Are they having a little party tonight? Like, Hey, look what was just released. I, I'm facetiously saying that. There, there are a lot of teams and supporters of everything at the, at the Disc Golf Pro Tour, but I watch a lot of live and then I don't go back and watch the post because I watched it live unless it's like a major highlight round. But with there being no live, you can better believe I'm watching post. Yeah, it'll be some bump. I mean, their numbers are so big, Matt, right now as far as views that I'm not sure that if even all the live people moved over to post that they would be like an exorbitant bump. Um, but I think if nothing else, it proves like their legitimacy. Well, that's the wrong word. They're already legitimate, but it proves the fact that post-produced, right, still has something to offer um, outside of that live can't, right, in some cases. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just say it's a bummer. I think uh, I'm glad to see the press release because it sounded like they took it serious. By the way, that's good PR. We just talked about some PR problems. It's good PR to say, look, here's all we did. We wish we could make it happen. Um, they told us a lot of details. A lot of people would be like, ah, we won't, we don't tell the public that, but they told us. And guess what? It makes me feel better about it. Even though I'm bummed. It's because Jeff Springs over there yeah, and that's, I, that's I'm the pro in, tour communication in all seriousness. That's what Jeff Spring brought when he came on is the, the PR and the way to manage that a uh, great guy yeah. to be running that. And then finally, I'm going to drop this one and we're going to go, <laughs> All right. we're going to keep this to two minutes, Josh, two minute topic here. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Brody Smith, here's my take in one minute. Okay. After we after we give the intro here, Brody Smith says circle one stats are no good for putting. This is on his Twitter. If you don't follow him over there, he says green in regulation to each circle, whether it's circle one or circle two is a good stat. It tells you how you played to get to the basket. Um, so here's my take on that. Uh, that's a lot to break down, but generally I agree. Why do we have circle one and circle two? It's to just tell us like how close you got to the basket. Because we do track footage. The, the putts are tracked based off of distance right now. So it's just telling you how well you got to that location. And that's what matters. Putting, I don't think it matters whether it's circle one or circle two. Just give us the footage. We're already doing that, as I said. So let's just see how they're putting. And so here's my take. Literally get rid of circle one. Make all putting, and we've talked about this before, make all putting happen inside of circle two with the same putting rules as it's always been for putting circle one make it circle two. I think that makes our par harder. Um, you, I think it'd be really interesting to do. Do you have any thoughts on that as we get ready to close out? Oh, the show? I mean, like I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, I'd have to go consume a little bit more. I saw Brody talk on that. And I'm sure there's lots of discussion to be had. Um, I'm just going to jump on your very last point just briefly, not whether or not C1X is a good or bad stat because a stat is a stat. It can't be good or bad. It is a stat, right? Um, but I absolutely, yeah, extend the circle to what we call a circle two and call it the circle. Like I am completely fine with that. Uh, I think really the only perceived downside by some players would be 
putting rules, right? Where you have to maintain a stance so you avoid jump putting, et cetera. Otherwise, who in the world like cares? And I realize that's a major factor. I'm not downplaying that. Some player it's going to be a big deal too. But for our top pros, extend it, simplify, simplify it, but make it more challenging. And then yeah, T T to green, um, right? In regulation becomes a much more meaningful a stat to tell the story of what's happening. So yeah, I go for it. Yeah, that was just one to leave people to think about and dwell on. Um, all right. I think we've made it to the end. I have never, ever closed out a show without my co-host, Nick. So yeah, I don't know what to say. You get to close it out, and I get to say you're awesome. So this is on you. You ready? Let's see how this goes. We did not practice. No, literally, I've never said this or even thought about it. But thanks, everybody. It's actually been great uh, for me to be able to hang out with my brother on the Nick and Matt show, even though I am not Nick. Uh, it's been exciting to talk disc golf with everybody. Um, I hope everyone out there, all the viewers, all the listeners on the podcast, go out and have a great week. Um, and I will say until next time, which I don't know when it'll be for me, but that's it. All right, Josh, you're awesome. The Nick and Matt show. A disc golf podcast designed for you, the disc golfer. Find the Nick and Matt show on your favorite podcast platforms or stream us live exclusively on the Foundation Podcast YouTube channel. 